We present Rope, a radio version of Patrick Hamilton's famous thriller set in the late 1920s. It stars Alan Rickman as Rupert Cadell and Adam Barham as Wyndham Brandon, with Andrew Branch as Charles Grinillo, Cyril Luckham as Sir Johnston Kentley, and Moya Leslie as Leela Arden. Rope by Patrick Hamilton. yourself, Grano. Feeling yourself again, Grano. Uh, give me some matches. Matches? Here you are. Coming. Oh. Isn't it about time you pulled yourself together, Grano? Sabo will be here in a quarter of an hour. You, you, you fully understand, Brandon, what we've done. Do I know what I've done? Yes, I know quite well what I've done. I have done murder. Yes. I have committed murder. I have committed passionless, motiveless, faultless and clueless murder. Bloodless and noiseless murder. Yes. An immaculate murder. I have killed. I have killed for the sake of danger and for the sake of killing. And I am alive, truly and wonderfully alive. That's what I've done, Grano. What's the matter? You're getting superstitious. No, no, I'm, I'm not superstitious. Then may I put on the light? No, no, you mayn't. Brandon. Yes. You remember when when Ronald came in? What do you mean? When Ronald came in. When Ronald came in here, when he came in from the car, you were standing at the door. Yes. Did you see anyone standing there? Up the street, uh, about 70 yards? No. But there was someone, there was a man. I, I saw him, I remembered. Well, what of it? <sighs> Nothing. <sighs> Brandon. Yes? When I met Ronald, when I met him, coming out of the Colosseum, when I met him and got him into the car, ready to bring him here, why shouldn't someone have seen us then? What do you mean by some... Someone, anyone. Did we think of that, Brandon? I did. It's in the room, you know. Do you think we'll get away with it? When, tonight? Yes. Are you suggesting that some psychic force emanating from this chest is going to advise Sir Johnston Kentley of the fact that the remains, or shall I say, the lifeless entirety of his 20-year-old son and heir is contained therein? My dear Granillo, if you're feeling in any way insecure, perhaps I'd better fortify you with a brief summary of facts. With mathematics, as it were. Let me please give Listen. you... What? Listen, I tell you. It's all right. I thought it was Sabo. Sabo, in the first place, will not be here until five minutes to nine, if then, for Sabo is seldom punctual. Sabo, in the second place, has been deprived by a wily master of his key. He will therefore ring. <laughs> Let me, I say, give you a cool narration of our transactions. This afternoon, at about two o'clock, Young Ronald Kentley, our fellow undergraduate, left his father's house with the object of visiting the Colosseum Music Hall. He did so. After the performance, he was met in the street by your good self and invited to this house. Mm -hmm. He was then given tea. And at 6.45 precisely, done to death by strangulation and rope. He was subsequently deposited in this chest. Tonight, at nine o'clock, his father, Sir Johnston Kentley, and three well-chosen friends of ours will come round here 
a regalement. They will talk small talk and depart. After the party, this party at 11 o'clock... It isn't a slip, is it, Brandon? Oh, my dear Crano, have we not already agreed that the entire beauty and piquancy of the evening will reside in the party itself? Now, at 11 o'clock tonight, I was saying, you and I will leave by car for Oxford. We will carry our fellow undergraduate. Our fellow undergraduate will never be heard of again. Our fellow undergraduate will not be murdered. He will be missing. That is the complete story and the perfection of criminality. The complete story of the perfect crime. I'm quite lucid, am I not? Yes. The party itself, Grano, you see, so far from being our vulnerable point, is the very apex, as it were, and consummation of our feet. Consider its ingredients. I still don't think we could have chosen better. There will be first, and by all means foremost, Sir Johnston Kentley, the father of... the occupant of the chest. It is he, as the father, who gives the entire macabre quality of the evening. Well chosen so far. We then, of course, require his wife, but she, being an invalid, was unobtainable, alas. <laughs> uh, hello? Hello? What? What? Put out that light! Put out that light, I tell you! Steady, Grano! Uh, hello, hello! Will you put down that receiver, uh, Grano? You're telling London you're afraid! Uh, Come over here and sit down. Well, go on. There are then Kenneth Ratlin and Leela Arden. They have been asked for their youth, innocence and good spirits alone. Also in Ratlin, who went to the same school and is at the same university as ourselves, you have about the most perfect specimen of ordinary humanity obtainable. And therefore, a suitable witness to this so extraordinary scene. So, unintellectual humanity is represented. The same applies to Leela, his female counterpart. <laughs> we then come to Rupert. Now, in Rupert, Grano, we have a very intriguing proposition. Rupert, in fact, is about the one man alive who might have seen this thing from our angle. That is, the artistic one. You will recall that we even contemplated at one time inviting him to share our dangers. Mm. And we eventually turned the notion down, not necessarily because it would have been too much for him to swallow intellectually, but simply because he would not have had the nerve. Rupert is a damnably brilliant poet, but perhaps a little too fastidious. So, he is in the same blissless ignorance as the rest. Nevertheless, he is intellect's representative and valued at that. Grano. Grano. Uh, uh, yes? What's the time? Oh, uh, it's, uh, oh n nearly five to nine. Sabo will be here at any moment now. I know. May I put on the lights? Oh, must you? Yes, I must. Can't you go on talking? No, I can't, I'm afraid. Go on. I'm all right. Put it on. I, I, I'm better now. Thank you. I thought you were going to lose your nerve for a moment, Grant. Oh, so did I. But I wasn't. God, you fool! Didn't I tell you to check up in here? What? On the floor. Look at this. The boys' coliseum. Oh. We can hang on that. Oh, what give, 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 give it to me. It must have fallen out of my waistcoat pocket. I, I, I put it here. Damnation, that sabo. Now, for God's sake, quiet yourself and sit down. Read the paper or play the piano or something. Good idea. The piano. Play yes. something soothing. I'll let sabo in. Yes. Sorry for my little outburst, Grano, but it rather upset me. Not at all. You were right. What's the time? Uh, it's just after five two. Then we can expect our first guest. <laughs> oh, yes. I, I must go and let Sam. Good evening, Sam. Good evening. 
evening, sir. So we have little late. Never no, no, mind, supper. The food's already in the kitchen. As the dining room's all covered with books, will you lay the supper on the chest in the sitting room? Uh, but I can bring the table from upstairs, sir. Oh, no, that's all right, Sabo. Lay it on the chest. Uh, no, sir, it will be no trouble to bring from upstairs. Uh, nevertheless, Sabo, lay it on the chest, will you? Very good, sir. In here? In here. Good evening, sir. Sabo. That's it. Um, plates and things on the side, please. Food on the chest, don't you? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> ah, here we are. He's early, whoever it is. Uh, to bring in here, sir? Yes, in here. Very good, sir. Don't stop playing, Grandpa. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, yes, please, sir. This way. I'm not late, am I? No, 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 sir. Uh, Mr. Hangland, sir. Hello, hello, Raglan, old man. Come right in. You know Granillo, don't you? Rather. Quite a long time since we met, though. Uh, yes, isn't it? Oh. I, I, I say, I, I'm terribly sorry. I've come dressed. My dear fellow. My fault entirely. <laughs> Come and seat yourself. Uh, I should have explained. You see, we're going up to Oxford tonight. Oh, uh, no. Are you? I'm not going up till Friday. Ah. Now, what are you going to drink? <laughs> uh, you can have uh, gin and Italian, mm -hmm. or gin and Angostura, uh, and I can do you a very nice gin and French. I should like gin and it, I think. Gin and it. Right. <laughs> yes, uh, we leave tonight about 12 and travel by automobile in the, let us hope... <laughs> Moonlight. <laughs> and, of course, this place is simply covered with books. Covered with books? Uh, yes, in the next room. Uh, I've come into a library. Here's your gin and it. Oh, thanks. Come into a library? Uh, yes. Did you ever hear of old Jerry Wickham, Kenneth? An uncle of mine. Oh, yes, rather. Well, you know that he's died just lately. Oh, has he? Uh, yes. Well, it's his library, uh, which is very kindly and unexpectedly bestowed upon me. Good Lord. <laughs> to the unspeakable mortification of Sir Johnston Kentley. Oh, Sir Johnston Kentley. He's quite a famous collector, isn't he? Yes, he's coming here tonight. Good heavens, is he? It is the same man, isn't it? He lives in Grosvenor Square and has a son. Quite right, Kenneth. He lives in Grosvenor Square and has a son. <laughs> Have you got a drink, Grano? Uh, uh, oh, yes. Well, Drink up, Kenneth. <laughs> Cheer ho. Mm. Tell me, Sir Johnston's son, isn't that Ronald Kentley, the lad who's so frightfully good at sports? That's right. You don't know him, do you? No. I've never met him, but he wins hurdles and hundreds of yards and things like that, doesn't he? <laughs> yes, that's right. As a matter of fact, he's the living image of yourself, isn't he, Grano? Uh, yes. Yes, he is like me. In what way? Oh, in every way. Same age, same height, same colour, same sweet and refreshing innocence. Oh, <laughs> shut up. I'm not an athlete anyway. No, but you're just as much alive. In fact, more so. Have I? <laughs> then you're having Sir Johnston here just sort of to make him grind his teeth with envy about the books, then? Oh, on the contrary. I'm going to let him have exactly what he wants, provided I don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm telling you all this, Kenneth, just to excuse the terrible mess we're in. You'll observe that we're having our meal off a chest. Oh, yes. I thought it looked rather weird. Good Lord, Kenneth. You're getting positively fat. Am I? Nothing like the little boy who used to fag for me at school. Lord, that's a while ago. But it doesn't seem so very long. Uh, of course, uh, I used to think you an absolute hero in those days, Brandon. <laughs> Did you? Uh, well, as a matter of fact, I was always more or less popular amongst the juniors. It was I who was the unpopular one. Were you unpopular, Grano? Oh, yes, I... I remember I used to loathe you in those days. There you are. Why did you loathe him? Oh, I don't know. I suppose games were the only things that ever counted in those days. I'm sure it was most unreasonable. It was, I assure you. <laughs> I'm very harmless. Here we are. I wonder if that's Rupert. Uh, did you ever meet Rupert, Kenneth, Rupert Cadell? No, I, I can't say that I have. Uh, no, he was before your time, wasn't he? Hmm. Aha! 
the ravishing Leela. <laughs> Come along, my dear, this way. How are you? You know Grano, uh, don't you? Hello. How do you do? And this is Kenneth. Uh, Mr. Raglan, Miss Arden. Hello. Hello. Now, what are you going to have, Leela? Kenneth's having a gin and it. I'd adore one. Gin and it? It shall be. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I simply know that I've seen you somewhere before. Really? You're not a friend and on sea expert, are you? <laughs> no, uh, I just go there occasionally, that's all. <laughs> How weird, because I could simply swear that I've seen you somewhere before. Oh. <laughs> How weird. <laughs> Previous <laughs> incarnation, I expect. Here you are, Leela. Thank you. Excuse, mess. We're in a horrible mess here altogether. Uh, Kenneth will tell you about it. I've come into a library. Come into a library, my dear? Yes. And I hope you don't think you're going to get anything to eat, because all the servants are away and we're very humble. No, you told me that, and I had a simply gluttonous high tea. Gorged, my dear. Oh, well, that's all right. I, I really wouldn't have asked you, only this is the last chance of seeing you before we go up. Are you going up tonight, then? Yes, of, of course. I'm feeling absolutely ghastly coming dressed like this. Why? Well, I'm sure I ought to be dressed, too. Of course, you must admit, my dear, this is a most mysterious and weird meal. Why? Mm, mysterious and, and weird? Oh, I don't know, Grano. Just mysterious and weird. Such a queer time to begin with. Oh, here we are. I'll bet you that's old Kentley. Forgive me a moment, I must go and usher him in. Who's the newcomer? Oh, uh, the, the newcomer, Leela, is, is the revered Sir Johnston Kentley, who has come here to, to look at books. My dear. Well, uh, unless it's Rupert, which of course it may be. Oh, no. No, it, it's Sir Johnston, all right. Which, of course, can never be done. <laughs> ah, how do you do, Grinello? Oh. And how are you getting on? Oh, very well, thank you, sir. Now, let me introduce you yes. all. Uh, Miss Arden, Sir Johnston Kentley. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, and this is Mr. Kenneth Raglan. How, how do you do, yeah. sir? How do you do? And here, Sir Johnston, is an armchair, <laughs> which I think is more or less in your line. <laughs> and and here is a chest from which we're going to feed, the table having been commandeered for books. Oh, that, but that chest, it's not a cassone, is it? Uh, no, sir, it's not genuine. It's a reproduction, but it's a rather nice piece. I got it in Italy. Now, will you have a cocktail, sir? Oh, good heavens, no, my boy. Now, uh, these books I'm going to see, uh, where are they? Uh, oh, they're in the other room, the dining room. I laid them out as well as I could, and there's more space in there. Oh, I shall be most interested to see them, most interested. I seem to remember that Wickham had a really remarkable little lot of Shakespeareana. Yes. Ah, that will be Rupert. Oh. I'm afraid, sir, the folios were sold before Wickham died. Oh. But there's a run of the quartos and a really amazing lot of Iconian stuff. <sighs> At least I'm told it's very fine. Oh. Uh, Miss Docadell, sir. Ah, here he is, here he is. Last as usual. Come along in, Rupert. Uh, Mr. Cadell, Miss Leela Arden. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, Mr. Cadell, Sir Johnston Kentley. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Uh, Mr. Raglan, Mr. Cadell. How do you do? But tell me, I don't quite follow. Have I come dressed, or have others come undressed? I telephoned an inquiry, but could not obtain um, any answer. Now contain yourself, Rupert, and sit down. What in heaven is this? This is a chest, Rupert, and we're going to have our meal off it. Oh, are we? Yes. Why are we going to have our meal off a chest? Because it's a very nice chest, and because all the tables are covered with books. Yes, haven't you heard? The entire place is covered with library. Oh. Now, Rupert, are you going to have a cocktail? No, no thank you. I've had four already. Four? four? Yes, why? Aren't I carrying my drink? Yes, you're carrying it all right. It's just rather a mean advantage, that's all. <laughs> that's all right, Sabo. I'll ring when we're through. Then you can clear and get away. Thank you, sir. When do we begin to have our meal off a chest? Because I'm personally rather peckish. We're starting right away, Rupert. Now, look here, you people. There are lots of plates and knives and things on the sideboard and lots of sandwiches and things on the chest. Pate, caviar, salmon and cucumber, whatnot. <laughs> all you've got to do is to rally round and help yourselves. <laughs> that's that's marvellous. Come on, then. Uh, oh, lovely. Look at this. I adore caviar, don't you? Yes, rather. Wait a minute and I'll get you some. Uh, what will you have, sir? Yes, uh, do you oh, want a sandwich, thanks. Thank you so much. 
Um, are you the great Cadell? What about some of this? The great oh, Cadell, sir. Why? Do you know anything about me? Well, I've read your poems, that's all. Mm. Or at least uh, a lot of them. Dear me, I hope you're not confusing me with the other Cadell, sir. No, I don't think so. You write poems, don't you? I am told so, sir, but then so does the other Cadell, a devastating creature who spells it with two Ds. Oh, oh no, there's no confusion. I never knew you could spell Cadell with two Ds. Same here. Mm. Yes, same here. I knew a Cadell once, and she used to spell it with only one D, Louisa Cadell. Horrible old hag she was, too. She lived in Bayswater. <laughs> Dear heaven, the young man is alluding to my aunt. Uh, oh, I say, I... I, I'm terribly sorry. Have I dropped a brick? No, you've said a mouthful. <laughs> Can I have another sandwich? I say, must we have our meal off a chest? Is Lady Kentley any better, sir? Um, no, I'm afraid not. I'm, I'm afraid she's still in bed. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, please. And how's Ronald getting on? Oh, Ronald. Oh, he's getting on all right. He's... Uh, Merely idling, of course, now, like you two. Does he like it, or, or does he want to get back? Oh, no, he doesn't want to get back. He has a great time. Who's Ronald? Ronald, he's my son and heir. Twenty years of age. Oh, I know Ronald. He was in the papers the other day for winning the high jump at the Varsity Sports. Oh, that's right. Yes, I remember it well. There was a picture of me next door to it. Oh? What's that? Yes. Not, though, for winning the high jump. Oh, yes, quite an old friend. Yes, he's a sprightly lad, is Ronald. <laughs> Brandon says he's like me. Is that true, sir? Um, uh, yes, he, he is rather like you when you come to think of it. Uh, quite like, really. I have a double, apparently. My dear, how excruciating! <laughs> in, in what way is he like me, sir? Well, I don't know, just in general usefulness. And innocence <laughs> and freshness and <laughs> gaiety. Oh, shut up, Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> He's so afraid they won't think him a man, isn't he? <laughs> That's like Ronald, too. I'm afraid they won't feel like that for long, though. No, they won't, poor dears. Of course. My boy's the most infantile thing in the world. I honestly believe his only passion in holiday time is the movies. When I saw him at lunch, he was just rushing off to the Coliseum. Yeah, but that's not the movies, is it? Hmm? I thought it was a music hall. Uh, not that oh. I know. I've never been there in my life. <laughs> never been to the Coliseum? Why should he have been to the Coliseum? Uh, I thought everybody had been. Well, I haven't. Uh, neither have I. I. Is that the place in the Haymarket? My dear Grano, you're mixing it up with the capital. What abysmal ignorance. <laughs> You'd have been a sad dog as an ancient Roman, Granillo. <laughs> yes, he would. Indeed, in the days of the Caesars, the results of confusing the Colosseum with the Capitol would have been, I should imagine, almost fatal. <laughs> but turn to the 20th century for just one moment. Do you mean to tell me, Granillo, that you have never been to the Colosseum? No. No, of course I haven't. Uh, never. Why? You mean you can... You can stand there and puff out your chest and tell me that you have never been to the Colosseum. Yes. Why? Why should you think that I had? Merely the hawk-like sharpness of my vision. <laughs> Why? Is it a crime never to have been to the Colosseum? No, sir. I don't expect it's a crime. For in that case, I'm afraid I myself am guilty. But young Ronald <laughs> has been to the Coliseum anyway, sir. Yeah, that's right. I simply must have one more of these delicious sandwiches. Let me. <laughs> you know, oh. Oh, I'm, I'm so coming so to the conclusion that there's some ulterior motive about this chest picnic. What do you mean, ulterior motive? Ah, you mean it's done purely to make you spill things on your trousers, Rupert. I think it's more than likely. Oh, I suspect much worse than that. I think they've committed murder. <laughs> and the chest is simply chock full of rotting bones. It's just the sort of thing for rotting bones, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> My dear, you're right. I wouldn't let you see the inside of that chest for worlds. I'm sure you wouldn't. Uh, 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 try, try one of these sandwiches, Leela. Oh, thank you. Mm, it's all, all very well to try and bluff me out and pretend you're willing to let me see But, my dear, that's just what I said I wouldn't do. I have my suspicions. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yes, but surely your murderer, having chopped up and concealed his victim in a chest, why, he wouldn't ask all his friends round to come and... Eat off it? Not <laughs> unless he was a very stupid 
And very conceited murderer. <laughs> very stupid and very conceited. But of course he might be. In fact, it's exactly what all criminals are. Oh, no, I don't think so. Well, anyway, who says books? Oh, that's a very good idea. I have a gramophone for the very young, if they care to make use of it. But I thought you said the next room was covered with books. Oh, no, there's room to dance. This way, Sir Johnston. Oh, thank you. Come along, the rest of you, when you want to, that is. I have dozens of records in there. You coming, Lena? Oh, rather. You dance, <laughs> well, uh, Rupert. Well, my dear Grano, you look rather fagged out. Oh, uh, do I? I? I don't feel it. What have you been doing with yourself? Doing with myself? Oh, nothing. Why do you ask? For no reason whatever. You seem rather touchy. Ah, uh, yes, yes, I, I'm a bit liverish. I've been sleeping most of the afternoon, and that always puts me out for the rest of the day. Ah, that's what I do. Uh, you, 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 uh, writing anything lately? Yes, a little thing about doves, and a little thing about rain. Both good, very good, in fact. And then, of course, I'm getting ahead with the big work. Oh, that going well? Yes, very. Indeed, it promises to be not only the best thing I've ever written, but the best thing I have ever read. <laughs> that tune. It's rather nice, isn't it? Mm. So, you and Brandon leave tonight for Oxford. That's right. What time are you going? Uh, we're aiming to start about 10.30. Arriving there about when? Oh, about three? Or why? Peculiar form of enjoyment, Grano. But then that's like you. <laughs> why? Lovely moonlight night. It's not. It's raining already. It's not. Yes, it is. Listen. Oh. oh yes. Yes, it is coming down, isn't it? Uh, excuse me, Granny. Reaching across oh, you. Yes. There's a book on the mantelpiece. Uh, got it. Thank you. Oh. Joseph Conrad. Dear me. Granny! Dear me. Granny, you're wanted! Oh, uh, coming! You, you, you coming along too, Rupert? No, I'm all right. With this book from the mantelpiece and this Coliseum ticket from your waistcoat pocket. Hmm. Stalls for the 17th. Come in. Excuse me, sir. May I clear the chest, sir? Um, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. How are you getting on? Very well, thank you, sir. It's going to be a dirty night. Yes, sir. It is a set-in now, sir. I suppose Mr Brandon will still be going, though. Pardon, sir? I suppose Mr Brandon will still be going, though, to Oxford. Oh, yes, sir. I, I suppose so, sir. Have you any idea of the date, sir? The date, sir? Yes, sir, it is the, the, the 16th, sir. The... No, no, sir, no, sir, it is not, sir. It is the 17th, sir. Yes, I thought so. The 17th. Stalls for the 17th. Have you been getting into trouble lately, Sabo? Trouble, sir? Yes, trouble. I was wondering whether you had been getting into any trouble with your employers. Me, sir? No, sir. What should make you think so, sir? Well, I telephoned this house at a quarter to nine and heard the most hysterical noises. Hysterical noises, hysterical, sir? Hysterical, Sabo, noises. Somebody had evidently lost their nerve. I was wondering whether you were the cause of it. Me, sir? Oh, no, sir, not me, sir. Uh, I was not here till five to nine. <laughs> then are you the one that frequents the Coliseum, Sabo? Yes, sir. I said, are you the one that frequents the Colosseum? Oh, sir, I, I did not hear, sir. Uh, pardon, sir. The Colosseum, sir? No, sir. You don't? Uh, the music hall, sir? Yes. Oh, no, sir, no, sir. I, well, I have been there once, sir, many years ago. But not lately? No, sir. Strange. 
Well, someone in this house frequents the Colosseum, Sabo, and Mr. Brandon and Mr. Granillo have both declared that they have never been there. Yet I found this Colosseum ticket in Mr. Granillo's waistcoat pocket. Which leaves me wondering, is it Mr. Granillo who frequents the Colosseum? Mr. Granillo, sir? Or is it Mr. Brandon who frequents the place? Mr. Brandon, sir. Hello, hello, Mr. Brandon. What's all this about Mr. Brandon? I was just asking the good Sabo Brandon whether Mr. Brandon would still travel to Oxford in all this rain. Wasn't I, Sabo? Uh, yes, sir. Well, I hope he told you that we are. What's a little rain, anyway? Now, have we any whiskey left? Oh, yes. I'll just take all this into the others. I'll be back in a minute. That's all right, Sabo. You can go straight away now, now that that's cleared. Thank you, sir. Back in a minute. That, Sabo, was what we call a white one. A white one, sir? Ah, sir, yes, sir. A white one, sir. Bonsoir, monsieur. Good night, Sabo. I wonder. I wonder. Hello? Sabo gone? Yes, Sabo gone. I want more cigarettes now. <laughs> Where are they? Brandon. Mm -hmm. I've just thought of something rather queer. Something queer? What's that? All this talk about rotting bones in chests. <laughs> talk about rotting bones in chests, Rupert? Yes. What about them? Do you remember when you were an infant, Brandon? Mm hmm. How you used to tell me stories around the fire? <laughs> yes, rather, I remember. Do you remember your chest complex, Brandon? My chest complex? Yes. Whatever the story was, piratical, detective, murder, adventure, or ghost, it always contained a marvelous denouement with a bloody chest containing corpses. You had a perfect mania for it, don't you remember? Yes. I'd forgotten that. <laughs> Why should you have remembered it? Yes. It's quite true. I remember now. <laughs> what about it, though? Oh, nothing. Just queer, that's all. Oh, queer, exactly. Well, just queer, us all talking tonight about rotting bones in chests. It just came back to me, that's all. <laughs> How's the old man getting on with his books? Going to take the entire library away with him, as far as I can see. I'm simply saying goodbye to it. Why don't you come in and watch him at it? Yes, I think I will. And I like that too. I say, what's the time? Uh, I want to be home fairly early tonight. Plenty of time. Come along. I'll just switch off the lights in here. Uh, now I've left the cigarettes I was told to fetch. Go along in, Rupert. I'll be in in a moment. Oh, very well. Oh, oh. to frighten you. Why do you want to sneak in like that? I wanted to see that everything was all right. Oh, I'm sorry. My nerve's going. I, I, I'll be all right. Oh. Pour, pour me another. Oh. Very well, then. But pull yourself together. <sighs> I say, Grandma. Yes? You've got that little ticket, haven't you? You'd better give it to me and we'll destroy it right away. Now. Ticket? Ronald's ticket. Ronald's ticket. Oh, don't yeah. dither, Grano. Ronald's mm. ticket. Ronald's Coliseum ticket. R Ronald's Coliseum ticket. Shh. Not so loud. Yes. I, I, I haven't got the Coliseum ticket. Oh, don't be a Oh, Grano, I gave it to you. you. You didn't give it to me. Grano. Oh, wait, wait, wait. It's in my, it's in my waistcoat pocket. I, 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 
Yeah, yes. Grano? Uh, you, you, you didn't... You, you, here, here, give it pocket. Uh, no, you, you didn't give it look to me. Look again, look again. I, I never had it. I gave it to you into your hand. I didn't. I, I never gave had it. it into your hand. Who said you got it? I gave it. I am got it. I tell you, where, where is it? In my waistcoat pocket. Oh, you put it in your waistcoat pocket. You put it in your waistcoat pocket. Where is it now? Where is it now? My dear Brandon, what have you lost? <laughs> my... Temper, Rupert. Sorry, Grano. It's, it's, it's all right. Oh, I hope I'm not interfering. Uh, no, no, it's my fault. <sighs> you didn't know that Grano and I behave like that, did you, Rupert? But we often have our little outbursts like this. Always about trifles, eh, Grano? Uh, yes. Oh. Well, as a matter of fact, I'm here on an errand. An errand? Yes, I want some rope. Rope? Rope? Yes, why so excited? Rope. The young people in the other room, having exhausted the lyric possibilities of the gramophone, are now projecting their entire youthful elan and ingenuity into the composition of a parcel, and they want something to do it up with. A parcel? Yes, the old man's books. Oh, of course. You'd better see what goes into it. I'm sure he's lifting all your best. Oh, hello. Oh. Here we are. I thought it was coming. Damnation. Surely you're not going to Oxford in all this. Oh, yes, we'll go. I'd clear up soon. <laughs> Besides, got nowhere to sleep here. Beds have all been dismantled. Well, that needn't worry you. You can come round and put up with me if you care. I've plenty of room. Uh, no, thank you, old boy. I think we'll try and make it. Very well. Have it your own way. Oh. Hello, did you hear that? Mm, we heard it all right. We're scared out of our wits. I know, and it's simply coming down in sheets. Surely you're not going to Oxford tonight. Certainly we are. But, my dear, you can't. You'll be simply swamped out, my dear. Flooded, my dear. I hear you want some string, uh, Yes, say we do. Kenneth, hmm? where are the books? Oh, here we are. We're going to make a parcel, my dear. Come on. All right. Ah, we've got some paper. Now, where's the string? Oh, the string's in the other room. I'll get it. No, 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 I'll get it. Where is it? It's in that sort of... Big vase thing, you know. Do you know the sort of big vase thing, Kenneth? Oh, yes, I know. I'll get it. Isn't he sweet? Yes, he is rather a lamb. Yes, a decided duck. Here we are. Uh, oh, and well Sir done. Johnston wants to know where he can browse on that sort of top shelf thing. I, I didn't quite... Oh, follow. yes, I know what he means. I say, Grano, put that glass down and go in and explain to him. Oh, fine. Poor old man's getting into hopeless muddles. It's all right. Oh, <coughs> I'll go. I'll go. Just a little, I think. I should say completely. What? Grano Blotto. <laughs> yes, <laughs> he is a bit. Well, help me with this thing. Hey, there, dear. <laughs> oh, oh, my hat. I believe you're afraid of storms, Leela. My dear, I am. I simply rush round in circles. It's hereditary, you know. Should see my mother. What does she rush round in? My dear, she doesn't. She simply hides herself in cupboards. Really? They're all entangled in the linen, my dear. If it comes on again, you'll probably all see me suddenly take a violent plunge into this chest. <laughs> I should love to see that. Head foremost, <laughs> my dear. By the way, can you get into this chest, or is it locked? Oh, put your finger on this lock for me, Kenneth. That's it. Right. Can you get into this chest, Brandon? Or is it locked? What? Uh, oh, yes. You can get into it if you want to. Oh, well then, I'm safe. Isn't there a lock on it, though? Uh, yes, there is. Oh, my dear, you've forgotten. He's got his murdered man in here. Oh, so <laughs> he has. We'd forgotten that, haven't we? Well, you may have. I hadn't. Finger on the knot again, can you please? Like that? Yes. That's what he's been committing. Murder. <laughs> Finger tighter, please. And we've caught him red-handed. Oh, Leela, you don't know how near the mark you are. Oh, don't I? I know exactly what's inside this chest. What? There's an old, old man. You picked him up selling papers in the street and you did him to death for the gold fillings in his teeth. You've a lust for gold, my dear. I <laughs> see so you've been following me. It is lock, isn't it? But why a padlock? What have you got in it? But you know, Leela, you have already explained to us what is in it. I honestly think you ought to let us have a look. Have you got the key? Yes, I've got the key. It's in my waistcoat pocket. Well, hand it over and let's have a look inside. I'm hanged if I do. But why not, my dear? 
If you're really innocent, you can prove it, dear. But how often have I to tell you, Leela, that I am not innocent? My hands are red with a crime committed less than three hours ago. Oh, well, if you won't, you won't. All the same, if I had strong men about me, they'd force it from you. I'll be your strong man. Will you, Kenneth? <laughs> All right, go and be strong. How do I do that? Oh, that's up to you. All right, then. <clears throat> Now then, Mr. Brandon, hand it over, or it'll be the worse for you. Said he, eyeing the other fearlessly. Come and get it, Kenneth. Um, which pocket is it in? Top. Right. Uh, my, my right or yours? Mine. Go on, seize it. I'll, I'll give him ten seconds, shall I? That's right. Right you are. Ten seconds. One. Two. Three. W w won't you surrender? No. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Uh, uh, oh, uh, hooray! Uh, uh, <laughs> My dears, what will uh, they not do for me? <laughs> Slaughtering each other, of course. <laughs> oh, oh, Mr. Oh, Raglan. Oh. We cannot on every occasion be strong, but it is always possible to be silent. What is he doing, dear? <sighs> I thought he'd bust my arm. I say, Brandon, you don't know your own strength, you know. You gave it an absolutely foul tar. Kenneth, I'm profoundly sorry. Really? No, that's all right. That's what you used to do to me at school. So I'm not your strong man after all, Leela. Never mind. You come back to the mother heart. I think he's a beast. No, Leela. Only a desperate criminal, that's all. How fearfully interested in crime we all seem to be tonight. Why poor Brandon can't be allowed to commit his own murders in quiet, I don't know. Ah, it's a simple question of bringing assassins to justice. Oh, uh, how would you do that? Why, by having them arrested, of course. Oh, would that do it? I've heard of assassins being brought to the Old Bailey, but I've seldom heard of them being brought to justice. I hope you're not confusing the two. Oh, I say, are you one of those people who don't approve of capital punishment? I think possibly I approve of murder too much to approve of capital punishment. Approve of murder? My dear Leela, there are so many people that I would so willingly murder, particularly the members of my own family, and including the aunt so felicitously described by Mr. Ragdon as living in Bayswater, <laughs> that it would be positively disingenuous to say that I don't approve of murder. Furthermore... I have already committed murder myself. How do you get that? It's all simply a question of scale. You, my friends, have paradoxically a horror of murder on a small scale, a veneration for it on a large. That is the difference between what we call murder and war. One gentleman murders another in a back alleyway in London for, let us say, since you have suggested it, the gold fillings in his teeth. And all society shrieks out for revenge upon the miscreant. And they call that murder. But when the entire youth and manhood of a whole nation rises up to slaughter the entire youth and manhood of another, not even for the gold fillings in each other's teeth, then society condones and applauds the outrage and calls it war. Mm. How then can I say that I disapprove of murder, seeing that I have, in the last great war, acted on these assumptions myself? A lamentable thing, certainly, and responsible for the fact that tonight, instead of being able to fool around the gramophone with you two, a thing I should very much like to have done, I have to hobble about like an old man. But... The point is that I have proved that I don't disapprove of murder. Haven't I? No, you've done nothing of the sort. You'd be the first to be horrified by murder if it happened under your own nose. I wonder. Besides, you must have some moral standards. Must I? I can't recall any. Don't be absurd. You wouldn't hurt a fly. Wouldn't I? I've had thousands in my time. What are your own moral standards, then, Leela? Mine? 
time? Oh, Leela believes in the Ten Commandments, doesn't she? Oh, no, surely not. Why? What's wrong with the Ten Commandments? Nothing whatever. Indeed, I have no doubt that they were of the profoundest significance to the nomadic needs of the tribe to whom they were delivered. Their inadequacy and irrelevance for today, though, must be sufficient to condemn them. I've often attempted to discover whether it is within the range of any of us to observe even one of them. Honour thy father and mother? Of course I do. How could I do otherwise? Indeed, on the occasion of my birthday, I have never failed to send them a telegram of congratulation. <laughs> Though whether this will make my days any longer in the land which has been given us must remain in doubt. But look at the others. Keep holy the Sabbath day. I don't. Take not the name of the Lord in vain. I do. Thou shalt do no murder. But I have done murder, as I have explained. And the seventh, Rupert? Committed. Since infancy. <laughs> Thou shalt not steal. But property itself, as Proudhon has explained to us, is theft. And I am a man of property. Moreover, these are your matches. You where did you...? Indeed, the only clause I am sincerely capable of hearing to is the little stricture concerning my neighbour's ox and my neighbour's ass. <laughs> few and far between, as are my neighbours who own oxes, and fewer and farther between, as are my neighbours who own asses, I honestly think I could face either type in an emergency with a pure heart. <laughs> but then, it might be different if I lived in a rural district. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I still say that you'd never commit a murder. Your conscience wouldn't let you. Ah. But have I a conscience? He's quite right. And for one who hasn't a conscience, I can understand murder being an entirely engrossing adventure. You mean a motiveless murder? Yes. Yes, that really does happen sometimes, doesn't it? You do get people who murder purely sort of for the fun of the thing, don't you? Oh, what a peculiar idea of fun. No, but I've heard of cases like that. Certainly you have, and I for one can certainly enter into the excitement of it. The only trouble about that sort of thing, is that you're bound to be found out. Why should you be found out? Because, my dear Brandon, that sort of murder would not be a motiveless murder at all. It would have quite a clear motive. Vanity. It would be a murder of vanity. And because of that, the criminal will be quite unable to keep from talking about it or showing it off in some fantastic way or another. The trouble with that sort of murderer is that he can't keep quiet about it. He won't hide it up. He wants to boast about it and say something, do something, and maybe something only just slightly outré, which gives him away. They have always done it, and they always will. Uh, but then, suppose your murderer... Your really ideal, brilliantly clever and competent murderer. A genius at it, I mean. Suppose he was alive to the fact that vanity was the Achilles heel to the thing and went specially out of his way to see that he wouldn't get caught like that. I I'm talking of a genius at it. Oh, yes, but then he'd never be able to keep from talking about the very fact that he was so brilliantly clever, as you put it. So he'd give himself away just the same. Yes, but he might be. So clever. Might. But wouldn't. Don't you think so? <gasps> Here we are. It's coming back again. Lord, yes, I'm getting sick of this storm. Yes, so am I. I say, you know, it's really about time I ought to be going. <laughs> yes. S same, same here, really. What an uncanny coincidence. Now you'll both be able to go together. <laughs> I say, isn't it absolutely awful? Isn't it terrible? Are you really still going to Oxford, you two? Certainly. The storm's probably only just around London. Besides, it's not so bad now. It's not raining, as a matter of fact, now. If you're thinking of getting off. No, that's what I thought. Same here. Which is another curious coincidence. Oh, do shut up. Ah, uh, excuse me. Hello? Uh, sorry, I can't hear. It's thundering, this end. What? Who? Who? The, oh, yes, yes, rather. Will you hold the line a minute? I'll get him. The, right you are. Just hold on. It's for Sir Johnston. Sir Johnston! 
You're wanted on the telephone, sir. The telephone for me? Uh, yes, sir, they're holding on. It's in this room. Oh, oh, thank you. Uh, here we are. Uh, excuse me, please. Uh, <coughs> uh, uh, hello, yes? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, ah, that you, dear? Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. No, no, he's not here. Yes, yes, that's right. That's quite right, dear. Uh, huh? Huh? Oh, no, no, no. He'll be back soon, I expect. He's probably held up in the... Uh, the what? Uh, yes, dear. Uh, well, I'll be back there soon now. I'll be coming um, pretty well straight away. Uh -huh. Huh? Yes, dear, yes. Right you are. Right you are. <laughs> Goodbye. Um, uh, Ronald hasn't come back. Hasn't come back? No. Oh, that's, that's, that's a storm. Yes, that's what it must be. Didn't you say he'd been to the Coliseum? Yes, that's right. Was he expected back then, sir? Yes, apparently he arranged to get back to tea. My wife gets so alarmed if there's any hitch. Well, he'll probably be back by the time you get home. Yes. Yes, I, I expect he will. Uh, well, I, I, I must be off. Um, where did I leave my hat and coat? I, um, oh, yes, out in the hall. Yes, uh, I'll go and get them. Sir Johnston, we've got your parcel all ready. Oh, oh that is sweet of you. Thank you very much. Say, that's a wonderful parcel, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's not bad, is it? And I should say not. Yes, that, that's very convenient. There you are, sir. Oh, and oh thank you. Not uh, raining now. Uh, uh, but I expect uh, you'd like a taxi, wouldn't you, uh, sir? Yes, I, I think I'd like a taxi. I'd rather like to get back. Uh, I, I can't think where that boy's got to. Your hat, sir. Uh, oh, thank you. I've uh, never known him fail when he said he'd be back. Then he must be very filial, sir. Yes, he is. Well, then it only remains to thank him for the most charming evening, to say nothing of the most charming company. The company being even more delightful than the books. <laughs> and that's saying an enormous amount. Well, good night, young lady. Good night. Uh, good night, young man. Good night, sir. And good night, Mr. Cadell. Good night, sir. And you know, uh, Brandon, I'll have to give you something in exchange for these books. Oh, never, sir. Oh, yes, you must have something back. You must have some swaps, as we used to say. You must have your swaps. Oh, yes. Now you're forgetting them, sir. <laughs> right? Oh, oh, thank you. Oh, this won't do, will it? Just like me, just like me. I'm getting on, you know. Nonsense, sir. Yeah, I'm getting old. That's my trouble. Well, good night, Brandon. Uh, good night, uh, Granillo. Good night, Sir Johnson. Well, I'm going to. What part do you have to go to? Oh, I'm South Kensingtonish. Oh, th then we'll get a taxi, shall we? Uh, and I'll drop you. Okay. Where then do you live, Mr. Raglan? Me? Oh, I live up at Hampstead. Oh, I see. Then it'll be quite easy to drop her. <laughs> well, well, come along in, Grano. <clears throat> I think we must go now. Oh. Well, won't you stay and have another spot? Oh, no, I don't think so. Uh, thanks awfully. I think I ought to be going. Yes. It's the same here, R really. Well, if you're still going to Oxford tonight, I certainly wouldn't let him drive. What do you mean? I will not, Leela, you may be sure. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, Granny. You certainly ought. <laughs> what, 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 what do you mean? Well. Well. Are you coming? Uh, yes, Robert. I'm going too. Good night, yes, yes, Grinella. Yes, Good night, Rupert. Everyone got everything. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Oh, oh, and do be careful. You're going to box. See you in the next pack. Thank you. Well, 
all's well. God, I, I, I thought he got onto it. Oh, Rupert? Yes. Yes, so did I for a few moments. But that's what gave a peacock into the evening. He hadn't. You, you're sure he hadn't? Quite sure. I sometimes rather wish he had. God, Rupert. Queer lad. I wonder. If he'd been with us, he wouldn't have got drunk, Grano. I'm not drunk. I'm, I'm, I'm a little, little blurred, that's all. Oh, no, what's that? What? I, I thought I heard something. Oh, be yourself, Grano. Shh. I thought it was the bell. It, it was, it was. Well, what of it? I, I'll go and see. Rupert. He's left his cigarette case behind, apparently. Have you seen it? No. Well, it must be here somewhere. Did you find it? Oh. Hello. I thought you might give me another spot. You're welcome, Rupert. Have a seat. Thank you. Um, cigarette? Uh, <laughs> I beg your pardon. I had my case in my pocket all the time. Oh, you ass. Just a splash, Rupert. Yes, a generous one. Ah, here. Thanks. Oh, dear heaven, what unmentionable fatigue. What? Living. Living, living. I wonder if drink is a way out. Grano seems to agree with that. Yes, but he's not going to get any more. You're in a horrible state tonight, Granillo. You're positively silent drunk. Oh, I'm, I'm all right. I say, must we have all this light? What's wrong with the light? Nothing is wrong with the light, Granillo. Only I'm a creature of half-lights, and seeing that you have a pleasantly shaded little table lamp, can't we make use of it? Yes, I quite agree. But I hope you're not going to settle down too heavily and make yourself too much at home, because we've got to be off before long. Oh, that's better. Much better. I'm sad tonight, you know. And what's the time? Five and twenty to eleven. Five and twenty to eleven. Inspector, you're wanting to get rid of me, aren't you? Not at all, Rupert. I hope not. I'm full of melancholy and don't want to go home. You must bear with me. It's been such a, a strange evening. A strange evening? Why? Why it's strange? I can't tell you. That's my trouble. I suppose it's the thunder. One thing and another. Thunder always upsets me. Besides, I'm always melancholy at this hour. Five and twenty to eleven. It's a curious hour. Did you ever read Goldsmith's Night Piece? No. I can't say that I actually recall it. No, you should. It's about the city at night. I shall do his night piece up to date one of these days, and I shall make it five and twenty to eleven. Now. It's a wonderful hour. I am particularly susceptible to it. Why so wonderful? Because it is, I think, the hour when London asks why. When it wants to know what it's all about. When the tedium of activity and the folly of pleasure are equally transparent. It's the hour when jaded London theatre audiences are settling down in the darkness to the last act of plays of which they know the denouement only too well. They know that when the curtain's down, it'll be just a question of God save the king, and they'll be bundled out into a chilly, rainy night, where they'll have to fight for taxis, or, or rush for trains, or somehow transport themselves home to a cold supper and the prospect of another day tomorrow exactly similar to that which has passed. Oh. It's a horrible hour. I could enlarge upon the idea indefinitely. A macabre hour, for it is not only the hour of pleasure ended, 
It is the hour when pleasure itself has been found wanting. There. That is what this hour means to me, and it has, moreover, been thundery. Five and twenty to eleven. In brief, my dear Rupert, at this hour of the night, you see no earthly object in living. I fear not. Do you? I? Yes, of course I do. But then I'm interested in things. Why don't you get interested in things? Why don't you take up exploring, or cricket, or making love? or golf, or finance, or lecturing, or something. Or as you suggested this evening, murder. Or as you say, murder. Now, Rupert, we don't want to turn you oh, out. Oh, surely you're not going to do that. Surely you're not going to spoil my mood. No, we're not going to spoil any of your moods, but we've got to get going at some time. And we've got a bit of packing to do in one thing and another. No, you really mustn't spoil my mood. I shall write something tonight if I go on like this. My dear Rupert, a poetic frame of mind will hardly be induced by the spectacle of Grano and me filling suitcases. Oh, I certainly think it would. I'll tell you what. I'll stay and see you off. <laughs> I'm having another drink. That's enough of that, Grano. Mind your own business. Come along, Grano. Mind your own business. <sighs> well, it's not business. Stay and see us off, Rupert. Doesn't look as though we'll get off with Grano in this state. I'm perfectly sober. Why does he want to stay and see us off? That's what I want to know. Why does he want to stay and see us off? My dear Grano, Rupert has no earthly reason in wanting to stay and see us off, and I don't know what you're talking about. There's no doing anything with you. I'm getting sick of this. Come along, Rupert. You'd better go and leave him with me. Well, I've got to go, then. What do you mean, Rupert? Got to go? Well, I think I thought for a moment that perhaps you wanted me to go as well. Oh, nothing of the sort. I was getting fed up with all this silly chatter and wanted to be alone with Grano, that's all. I don't want you to go. You don't? No. All right, then I'll stay. I said so. I said so. Grano! You're in a queer mood tonight too, Rupert. Oh, no, not a queer mood. An inspired mood, rather. One has inspirations, you know, extraordinary inspirations, and I have one tonight. Oh? What's that? Ah. Uh, I'll tell you that, perhaps. You haven't such a thing as a pin, Grinello, have you? A what? A pin. Y yes. yes it's, what, what do you want it for? I want it for my buttonhole. Uh -huh. Here you are. Rupert, what are you pinning in your buttonhole? A theatre ticket. <gasps> he's got it. He's got it. Hold your tongue. Oh, yes, he's got it. All Hold right. your tongue. He's got Hold it. your tongue. Hold he's your got tongue. It. <laughs> Rupert. Yes? Rupert, this is nothing to do with you. Grano and I have a certain trouble between us which concerns no one else. Will you kindly oblige us by going at once and leaving us to it? Won't you tell me our trouble, Brandon? I might be able to help. No, I will not tell you our trouble. Please, go. It's nothing to do with you. No, Brandon, it may not be anything to do with me. But it may possibly be something to do with the public in general, and I'm its only representative in this room. Won't you tell me? Are you going, or are you not? No, Brandon, I'm not going. <laughs> You see, I'm rather awkwardly situated. You're something more than that, my friend. Oh? How's that? You are very dangerously situated. Very dangerously situated indeed. Brandon, I have no protection. You have not. Save that of my foresight. Foresight? this whistle. A policeman gave it to me. I see. And when did he give you that? He gave it to me a few minutes ago before I came back from my cigarette case. He is now waiting for me to use it. He is waiting at the corner. It depends upon you whether I shall use it or not. What do you want from me, Rupert? I want two things. 
two truths. I want the truth about this ticket here and the truth about that chest, or rather its contents. Well, I can satisfy you on both. As for the ticket, it, I, I know nothing whatever about it. As for the chest, I simply do not know what you mean. You have succeeded in satisfying me on neither. Rupert, I've come to the conclusion that you are hopelessly drunk and that you'd better go home. It is possible that I am drunk, but not hopelessly, and I am not going home. <laughs> what is all this about? What is all this maudlin suspiciousness? This is not maudlin suspiciousness, Brandon. It is well-founded. From the first moment when I telephoned this house at a quarter to nine and heard over the wire your friend there crying for the dark, the suspicion was there. And that suspicion has been growing ever since. Growing ever since? Growing ever since? What do you mean? What do you suspect? I suspect murder, Brandon. The murder of Ronald Kentley. <laughs> oh, oh, my poor, poor Rupert. You don't know how you've relieved me. I imagined you'd got onto the real truth, which would have been devilish awkward. Murder. Oh, dear, that's good. Hear that, Grano. He suspects us of murder. Murder. Isn't that too rich? Is it possible that you're trying to bluff me? Bluff you? Bluff you? Get on out of here. Blow your whistle, blow your whistle, and bring the policeman in. Get on out. Do what you like. Ah, since you say I can do what I like, may I see the inside of that chest? See the inside of that chest? See the inside of that chest? You can see the inside of 50,000 chests. Get on out. I did not ask to see the inside of 50,000 chests, Brandon, but to see the inside of this specific chest, and I cannot do that if I have to get on out. You're drunk. Possibly. Nevertheless, may I look inside that chest? Yes. Very well. I will. Go on, then. What are you waiting for? The key to the padlock, if you please. Oh, the key. It's upstairs, I think. Upstairs? Yes. Shall I go and get it? No, don't do that. I can force it. Must I? Must I do this? Here's your key. Now look and get what's coming to you. Thank you. You'll be sorry if you look in there, Goodell. You'll be sorry. I'll take the risk. Oh. You swine. You dirty swine. Now then, Rupert, sit down. I want to talk to you. Poor Ronald Kentley. What had he done to you? Sit down, Rupert. I, I want to talk sit to you. Sit down, Brandon. What do you mean? Sit down. For God's sake, sit down and listen. I want to explain. Explain? Oh, sit down. I'm at your mercy, I tell you. I'm at your mercy. Have mercy on me. I can explain. Have mercy on me. Sit down and judge me. Judge me. Well? Rupert, you're an enlightened man, aren't you? I profess to be, yes. And it is in your power to have me hanged. So it seems. And Granillo, too. And Granillo, too. Rupert. Yes? You remember our talk tonight about the old Bailey and justice? Yes, well? And the difference between the two. You made the point. Yes. Yes. Well, remember that. You wouldn't be giving us up to justice. And now I want to ask you about something else you said. You... Do not rate life as a very precious thing, do you? No. Now listen, Rupert, listen. I have done this thing. I and Granilla, we have done it together. We have done it for adventure. For adventure and danger. For danger! 
You read Nietzsche, don't you, Rupert? Yes. And you know that he tells us to live dangerously. Yes. So we thought we would do so. That's all. We have done so. We have only done the thing. Others have talked. We have done. Do you understand? Go on. Listen, Rupert, listen. You're understanding. You're the one man to understand. Now, apart from all that, quite apart, even if you can't see how we look at it, you'll see that you can't give us up. Two lives can't recall one. It'd just be triple murder. You'd never allow that. But apart from that, too, our lives are in your hands. Your hands, man! I give them into your hands. You can't kill us. You can't kill. You're not a murderer, Rupert. What are you? We aren't. We aren't, I tell you! Don't tell me you're a slave to your period. You're an emancipated man. Rupert, you can't give us up. You know you can't. You can't, you can't. You can't. Can you? Yes, I know. There's every truth in what you've said. This is a very queer, dark, and incomprehensible universe, and I understand it little. I myself have always tried to apply pure logic to it, and the application of logic can lead us into strange passes. It has done so in this case. I shall never trust logic again. You've said that I hold life cheap. You're right, I do. Your own included. What do you mean? What do I mean? I mean that you have taken and killed by strangulation a very harmless and helpless fellow creature of 20 years. I mean that in that chest there now lie the staring and futile remains of something that four hours ago lived and laughed and ran and found it good. Laughed as you could never laugh and ran as you could never run. I mean that for your cruel, scheming pleasure, you have committed a sin and a blasphemy against that very life which you now find yourself so precious. And you've done more than this. You've not only killed him, you have rotted the lives of all those to whom he was dear. And in dragging his father round here tonight, you have played a lewd and infamous jest upon him, and a bad jest at that. And if you think, as your type of philosopher generally does, that all life is nothing but a bad jest, then you will now have the pleasure of seeing it played upon yourselves. What are you saying? What are you going to do? It's not what I'm going to do, Brandon. It is what society is going to do. And what will happen to you at the hands of society, I'm not in a position to tell you. But I can give you a pretty shrewd guess, I think. You're going to hang. Hang. Both of you. Hang. In Rope by Patrick Hamilton, Alan Rickman played Rupert Cadell and Adam Barham, Wyndon Brandon. Andrew Branch was Charles Grunello and Christopher Good, Kenneth Raglan. Cyril Luckham played the part of Sir Johnston Kentley and Moya Leslie, Leela Arden. Sabo was played by Olivier Pierre. The pianist was Mary Nash. The play was directed by John Tideman. Sins of the Father by Bill Lyons. Another play about the two cops, Vogel and Fraser, with Douglas Livingstone and Nigel Hawthorne. And I don't want to seem neurotic, but it's about time his name came off the door and mine went up. I'm fed up with people coming in and calling me Inspector Bins. Vogel. V-O-G-E-L. Hello, Jimmy. Oh, sir. Oh, thanks. Mm. Teething troubles? Trying to get things into some sort of order. Guy, imagine he left this squash racket behind, too. Shall I send it on to him? Where is Dusty now, anyway? Inspector Bins? Oh, he should be well on the way to his new appointment in Glasgow. <laughs> Rather him than me. He won't be needing this up there. Bloody savages, they are. Yes, there's something rather endearing about your broad-mindedness. Oh, my God, how long are you going to keep this up for? Eh? This office. It's so tidy. 
It's not you, Jimmy. It's the new me. See, all the files in order, too. So you'll never be able to find anything now. They used to be indexed by the dust. Rubbish, it's all worked out. I've got a system. Bit of a contrast to your home life, isn't it? What do you mean? Well, you seem to be in danger of disappearing under an avalanche of baked bean tins there. They've overrun your dustbin already. <laughs> you been checking up on me, sir? No, of course not, Jimmy. I, I just happened to be passing your place on my way to uh, visit a sick auntie. I see. And how was she? Oh. Your auntie. Oh, sick. Shame. <laughs> yes. Um, you heard from Mo? We spoke on the phone last week. But no prospect of you two getting together again? No. Pity. Yes. Of course, it's very sad for you, um, you, your daughter. Um, Tina. Uh, yeah, Tina, yes, right. Yes, I always think it's the children that suffer. Mo says she's quite cheerful. Damn shame, though. The whole business. It doesn't affect my work, sir. I'm still a good jack. Yes, yes, of course. Does Mo know about the promotion? I did mention it, yes, sir. Ironic, really. She went through all those years with you when you were being passed over, and now you've made it to Inspector. Is this a social visit, sir? Uh, uh, no, no. I've, I've got a case for you. Oh. That uh, needs tact, Jimmy. So let's hope the new you is more than just a tidy office. What's on? Been a series of break-ins in C-Division. Signs are it's juveniles, but they're good and getting better. Well, it's local stuff. They don't need crime squad to charge a few snotty you know, kids. No, it's a bit more serious than that, Jimmy. I told you, they're getting better. They've learnt what to take and what to leave. Insurance value of the last lot was over 10,000. And the local boys reckon that's too big for them to handle? Well, I've said we'd help out. <laughs> With respect, sir, haven't we got enough on our plates just now? now? Do you know the local MP down there, Jimmy? Sutton, isn't it? Yes. That was his place that was broken into. You play squash with him sometimes. That's got see? nothing to do with it. He's an undersecretary at the Home Office. With a big law and order debate coming up. This isn't political, is it? Special branch stuff. No, Jimmy, it isn't. Stop making problems. Now get your best suit on and get down there. OK, sir. And, Jimmy, don't stub your fags out on his carpet. So sorry to keep you waiting, Inspector. <clears throat> but my husband is most conscientious about his constituents... Many's the dinner that's been ruined while he wrestles with their problems. I see. Well, well, well perhaps I could talk to you in the meantime. Well, naturally, I'll tell you anything I can. Uh, but Charles did say that he wanted to talk to you personally about the way the case was to be handled. I've been over your statement to the local police. It seems pretty straightforward. Would you like a beer? Eh? You look a little hot. Oh, um... Well, th thanks. It'd be very nice. I know I keep the central heating too high, but I'm a very cold-blooded creature. I don't function below 75 degrees. And one can't change the way one is. And Charles is always getting cross about it. Says we should set a better example by saving it. What? Energy. Uh, would you like to pour this yourself? I always get too much uh, a froth on it. Oh, thanks. Oh, Sorry. You haven't got an ashtray. Oh, uh, <laughs> You were saying? Uh, about my statement. Oh, uh, yes. It, it seems pretty straightforward, but there's a few points I'd like to go over again. Very well. They did a pretty thorough job on the place. Doesn't seem to be much as both valuable and portable they missed. Now, that could be just because they're efficient villains, but I have to allow for the possibility they knew what they'd come for, maybe even been here before. How about your husband's work? Does he ever talk to constituents about their problems here? Occasionally, yes, but it's most unusual. He does that sort of thing at the office. Would he have a record of any such meetings? I imagine so, but you'd have to ask him. Charles is very good at keeping records. Yes. I suppose he'd do a fair bit of entertaining, dinner and that. Naturally. Then could you make me out a list of who'd been here recently? Certainly not. Eh? Well, we can surely rule our friends out of your inquiries, Inspector... I'd hate to think you were going round cross-questioning them. That's not in my mind at the moment, Mrs Sutton, but I have to be able to run this investigation as I think fit. It might be better if you discuss this with Charles first. I'm sure your superiors would agree. After all, Mr Fraser has had dinner here himself. How about your son? I beg your pardon? Does he have his mates over? Most kids do. Of course. But the fees at his school are £3,000 a year. And I hope you won't think me a snob if I suggest to you that that probably makes it an unlikely breeding ground for petty criminals. 
It's a fair point, I suppose. Um, how about the servants? The days of butlers and underfootmen are now gone, Inspector. But we do have a daily, a chauffeur and a gardener, all of whom are beyond suspicion, and I don't want them bothered. Sorry. High Street traders worried about their windows with the cup tie coming up. Hello, Charles. Hello, darling. <coughs> Hello, Inspector. Glad to see my wife making you welcome. Play your cards right and you might get to sample her pate. Hardly. The inspector regards anyone who eats here as a potential suspect. What? It's not that. I just don't like being told how to do my job. Any, any more than you would. You didn't exactly make a big hit with the Suttons, Jimmy. Well, if you want to know, they weren't exactly number one in my charts either. Tact, I said, remember? I had a call from them this morning. I was just doing my job. Yes. If anything sensitive has gone walking, it's down to special branch. Mr. Sutton is quite aware of his responsibilities. He made that clear on the phone. You're not expecting me to go back and apologise, are you? No. Every man to what he's good at. I'll smooth the Suttons over. <laughs> Meanwhile, you get down to the local Nick. Give their files a look over. Chat the jacks. See if there's anything about the modus operandi that sets that nose of yours twitching. It is already, and I reckon it's political. It isn't. That's official. It's kids. So what am I looking for? Nappy pins the local jacks missed at the scene of the crime? Usual stuff. Previous victims, types of haul. Sounds more like boots than nose. I thought I'd been promoted out of that lot. They promised to put a couple of DCs at your disposal. Use them. Right. And remember, Jimmy, don't try to be one of the lads. Be matey enough to get good work out of them, but remember, you're in charge. Yes, sir. I suppose we've had no bites on that list. Fences? No, not yet, no. I was never hopeful. Nothing easily enough identifiable. They're not going to tell us they've been offered it if they reckon they can get away with selling it. Besides, if it's juveniles, uh, they'd be unlikely to go through known dealers anyway. Depends how professional they are. And how much we buy the juvenile idea in the first place. Mm. We can't take the local jacks as gospel. They may not be too bright. Well, there's quite a lot of points that way. A curtain twitcher who thought she saw some boys hanging around a house that was later burgled. Entry through a skylight that seemed too small for a full-grown man. Some footprints in a flower bed with a size five shoe. Not exactly red hot, is it? Okay, we can't rule out a group which includes a girl or a small man. Or a trained monkey with size five shoes, I suppose. But on balance, I think kids are more likely. Dead cunning, they're monkeys. Off you go, Jimmy. They're expecting you. Morning. I'm Detective Inspector Bogle, Crime Squad. This office has been assigned to me. Mm, that's right, sir. There's supposed to be two DCs for me, too. I suppose the lazy sods are late. Well, I'm not, sir. Hey? I'm one of them, Joe Blackett. I see. I wasn't exactly expecting it. Still, never mind. I'm sure you're very capable. I do my best, sir. How about the other one? Dave Walker. He's entirely male, to the best of my knowledge, sir. I see. Well, it might be useful to have a woman police officer along when there's maybe kids involved. I can do the same work as Dave, sir. You reckon? Where is he, anyway? Uh, would you like me to ring the duty officer and see if he's reported in, sir? Yeah. Pleasant as it is, sitting here, staring at your legs. I reckon we ought to get some work done. Right, sir. Ah. Sorry, I'm late, sir. DC Walker. Yes, sir. You were supposed to be here at ten, lad. Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. Didn't come off duty till past midnight last night, sir. Then you must be knocking up enough overtime to afford a decent alarm clock. Yes, sir. Get down to work, then, shall we? <clears throat> Twelve break-ins in three months. Nearly one a week with a blank in early September. The last one big. Big enough for a lot of people to take notice, but your governor reckons it's down to the same team. You don't. I don't know. There are enough similarities in the M.O. for us to have to eliminate this team anyway, so let's concentrate on that and see what comes up. You've both got copies of it? Yes, oh, yes sir. sir. Right. As you can see, not much of a pattern to days, but they've never done one on a Tuesday or a Thursday. Friday's favourite with four out of twelve. I wouldn't give much significance to that, other than it being a good night for going out and leaving your house invitingly empty. We're looking for links, but to be honest, it seems pretty haphazard. Mm. Method of entry is fairly constant, though. Upstairs window in 8 out of 12. One of our villains is small and agile, probably a juvenile. Mind you, he's good. A pro. We think there's two of them. They're both efficient and they don't panic. They're not your average runner yobbos, either. They don't bother with messing the place or daubing rude words on the wall. They're in and out quick. And they only stop long enough to lift what's valuable and easily disposed of. Which brings us to the one confusing point. It smells of inside work... They often seem to know what they're after. 
Yet there's no link that we can see between the victims. How about insurance? Four of them didn't have any. The others are with different companies, so that's a non-starter. Mm -hmm. I've divided the list into two, and you're going down to get fresh statements from all of them. Oh, what's the point? They're hardly going to remember anything now they didn't think of three months ago. That depends how good you are, doesn't it, son? Yes, sir. Three months ago, you thought you were looking for a yobbo who suddenly took it into his head to turn over the nearest house. A one-off. So if you didn't catch him at it, there was practically no chance. Now we know different. Chummy's got a mind. These break-ins were well-planned and well-executed. Learn how he thinks, and we've as good as got him. Uh, would you like Danish pastry? No, I don't think so, thanks. Ah, uh, well, um, um... I'm afraid I'm rather more easily tempted. <laughs> uh, yes, I'll uh, have that, that one there, please. Splendid. Thank you very much. Now, shall I be mother? Why not? I get bored with it. <laughs> yes, it must be difficult as a one-parent family. It was a joke, Mr. Fraser, just a joke. Tina and I get on fine, thank you. I'm sure you do. Much better than Jimmy does without you. Uh, sh oh, sorry, sugar. No, thanks. I like this place. You have your tea and comfort. No one ever bothers you. It's full of old ladies in hats. Yes, well, of course, they're the backbone of this country. Dreadful thought. Well, why? I don't see that they contribute anything to the country by sitting here all day spending the interest on their shares. Well, they do no one any harm. They never come out on strike. At Christmas time, they're wheeled out to deliver presents to pampered grandchildren. I consider that a most worthwhile existence. Mm. We didn't come here to discuss old ladies, anyway. Um, no. Just what did you ask me here for? Oh, nothing since time. Friendly chat, that's all. Did Jimmy put you up to it? No, no, it's my own idea. I don't know you all that well, Superintendent, but from what Jimmy told me about you, you are not the type to waste your time on friendly chats. Yes, well, I'm under no illusions as to what my men say about me behind my back, Mrs. Vogel, and I am probably guilty on all counts, but uh, I still think they'd admit I'd get results. I know them, you see. Every one of them, down to the newest DC. I know what makes them tick. It's part of my job, because... If any of them has any emotional or financial difficulties, it might impair their abilities, Jack. And that's what this is all about, isn't it? Yes. You're an intelligent woman. I wouldn't insult you by trying to flannel you. There's no point trying to push me around, either. I'm not one of your team. Oh, I'm no intention of pushing you, but um, it is possible we might be able to help each other. I doubt it. Now, quite apart from the job, I can honestly say I rather like Jimmy... As a colleague, he can be infuriating, but he has a certain indomitable spirit one cannot help but admire. Now, as you already said, we don't know each other all that well, but um, working with him, I formed the impression that you two were, well, probably are, very fond of each other. Drop dead, Mr. Fraser. He needs you with him. Now, it may be that you are quite able to cope without him, but... Um, if Jimmy wants to see me, he knows where I am. Well, you know what he's like. Yes. And I'm beginning to get an idea of what you're like, too. Thanks for the tea and your concern. My pleasure. Um, think it over, won't you? I've not been doing a lot else these last few months. Bye. Ma'am. Um, oh, another... Pot of tea, please. Um, oh, and uh, Miss, uh, I think I might be tempted to another Danish pastry. We uh, we don't seem to have got very far, do we? The only thing they all have in common is that they're fed up with the police. OK, I'll admit there's not a lot to go on yet. There's not really anything new at all. Maybe it's been there all along and you haven't seen it. Maybe. Did you, for instance, notice that they're all families with children? which is also to say that they've all been houses with three or four bedrooms, which is probably more significant to our villain. But all with teenage boys, now I come to think of it. Oh, you reckon we might have some local Fagin, do you, sir? It might help us to find where they're getting their information. No, they all go to different schools. Inspector Morris checked that one out early. Boys don't only meet each other at school, you know. And anyway, Mrs Bowles hasn't got a teenage boy. 
Unless her Sylvia's had a sex change. Oh, Jay. <laughs> it is not unknown for a 15-year-old girl to tag along with some lads. Remind me to give you a lecture on that one day. And I still think 11 out of 12 is a bit more than coincidence. Vogel? Where? I'll be right over. Tell him not to stamp on anything with his big boots. Been another break-in. Looks like our team. Home beat man's there. The owner's your mayor. And he's going bananas. I don't think he's got a teenage son. Pity. Maybe not. But he has got a nice little alarm system and they bypassed it with no trouble. Walked off with another 4,000 quid's worth. Oh, they really are improving. Yep. We better knock them off soon or they'll be into Buckingham Palace. Come on, Batman and Robin. Let's go and shut the stable door. <laughs> Bags are Batman. <laughs> and how many people would have known you'd be out tonight, sir? Anyone that took the slightest interest in local affairs. The twinning committee had this take pencil in a year ago. Oh, yes, that's right. It's down here. You're entertaining some high-powered frog. We were returning the hospitality we received in France last year. Yes. I suppose Mr Sutton would be there for a do like that. Charles was present, yes. Why? Nothing. It's just that his place was turned over last week. Well, that seems to be something we have in common with too many people locally. It's about time you did something about it. We're trying, sir. About this uh, alarm system of yours... Recommended by one of your crime prevention officers. That's not exactly my information, sir. Well, the system he recommended at first was far too expensive. I don't have anything valuable enough to warrant that sort of outlay. He considered this the next best thing. I've got that in writing. I see. What exactly is covered? The safe is protected by a beam system. All downstairs doors and windows are wired in, plus the three bedrooms and bathroom upstairs. But there's no alarm on the windows of the lavatory or the loft extension. Well, your crime prevention officer thought that they were the least likely methods of entry since they both meant a climb of 30 feet and there was no way of getting a ladder against the house there. Sounds a logical enough conclusion. Except that was just the entry they chose. Which suggests they knew the alarm lay out before they came. Or your man didn't know his job. Well, let's see. The lavatory window was the only one open. They had to climb two drain pipes. Mm. Now, the logical way to get between them would be to edge along the windowsill of the side bedroom, but they didn't do that. They went over the conservatory, which has to be risky, even for someone as light as we think the climber is. What made them choose that way? Luck? <laughs> no. They knew the other one would set off the alarm. Are you suggesting this is an inside job? Who might you have discussed your alarm system with? Well, it's hardly the sort of thing one makes conversation about. But you must have been proud of it. Think. I'm not a complete fool, Inspector. No, one last thing. Was there anything sensitive in your safe? I beg your pardon? You know, documents and that. I told the uniformed officer everything that was taken. Yes, of course you did. I'll be in touch. Nothing like a game of squash to keep you in trim, eh? Um, well, I don't know about that. I always seem to drink back any calories I might have used up in here. <laughs> oh, you play a good game, though. Hold the central line. Oh, many thanks. I'm always trying to explain to young Tony here that that's the secret of the thing. Such a drag. If I'd known you'd find another partner, I wouldn't bother to come. I'm afraid my son's not very good at squash. He's not interested, you see. Boxing's his passion. Uh, Won several cups. I'm sure Mr. Fraser doesn't want to be bored with your proud parent act, Father. You'll excuse me. Hey, Simon, how about a little Sorry about that. <laughs> it doesn't mean to be rude, but you know what teenagers are. I expect we were both as bad. Actually, I'm glad to get the chance to speak to you alone. Oh, yes? I was wondering what progress you'd made with my break. Uh, now, I thought I'd come here to play squash. <laughs> I try and leave my work behind at the office, you know. Besides, it's Inspector Vogel's case. Well, that's just it. He's not exactly sensitive of people's feelings, your inspector. Hmm? I was talking to Dennis Pritchard, the mayor, and he's formed the same impression. Well, apparently this Vogel's been blundering around questioning his friends as to what he might have said about his alarm system. Well, it seems a fairly sensible line of inquiry to me. Well, it needs to be done with tact. After all, he mentioned it when he was at dinner with us. <laughs> but I'm hardly likely to put on a black mask and carry a bag-marked swag, now am I? Well, no one's suggesting that. But it does show that Pritchard's not as careful as he thinks. Well, couldn't you take the case over yourself? We'd be a lot No, happier. no, it can't be done. It could leave you to the tender mercies of the local police. Probably have to if something bigger turns up. But um, from what I've heard, you'll not be too pleased with that either. So you'll have to learn to love Jimmy Vogel, warts and all. Hmm? Oh, what 
All right, I'm coming. time is it? Late. Can I come in? Uh, yeah, you better. I was a bit tired last night. Uh, went to sleep in the chair. Yes. Have you had any breakfast? Eh? I could fix you something if you like. What's going on? You were supposed to be at a meeting this morning, sir. Nine o'clock, Superintendent Fraser. Oh, bloody stupid time for a meeting anyway. Have to get an alarm clock. Oh, very sharp. Is through there. What is? The kitchen. Oh, thanks. <sighs> what would you like? Don't know. You don't seem to have a lot in. I haven't had time to go shopping yet this week. Mm, there's some blancmange, plenty of dog biscuits. Was there a special offer? Just coffee, you'll be fine. It's in the jar marked rice. About this meeting. Oh, it's all right. I told them you'd phoned early, following up a lead. Were they convinced? I don't know. Does it matter? Not really. Why'd you do it? I knew you were a bit overtired last night, sir. I mean, why help me out like that? My governor's been bleating about this case being a non-starter. I was worried your meeting might take me off it. That way I'll end up doing the filing, sorting the figures. <sighs> and you reckon you'll be better off with me? I want to get on to Crime Squad, sir. I'm good. I just need a chance to prove it. My God, all this keenness first thing in the morning could turn my stomach. I'm surprised you've got a stomach left after what you put away last night. Watch it, Constable. Sorry, sir. Uh, would you like me to tidy up a bit while I'm waiting for the kettle to boil? It is a bit of a mess, isn't it? Won't take long. So, you've got ambitions to become the great detective, have you? Why not? No reason. I was quite keen myself once, you know, in the dim, distant past. I still have my moments. I'll bet. What do you reckon to this lot? Why the sudden move up market? Well, it's the logical thing to do as they get better. More selective. Yeah. Uh, did you want the phone back on the hook? I didn't know it was off. Of course, as they move up, they'll find it more difficult to fence the stuff. That's a thought. Or maybe they moved up because they found the fence. That's another. And if I'm right about them, they know what's going to need fencing before they pinch it. In which case, you and Dave are going to need your walking shoes again. Oh, uh, Jimmy, uh, was it about the meeting? No, I just happened to be passing. I see. Pity, I'm just going out, actually, visiting fences. Got my DCs asking around, thought I'd sound out Eric Roy. He's still at it. I nicked him 20 years ago. I'll give you a lift. Not much out of my way. Is it still at the old shop? Yeah, but uh, there's no need. I've got my own car. Well, give us a chance to have a natter. Come on. Yes, sir. How's it going? What? The case. Making progress? Yeah, I think so. New developments? <laughs> I'm not about to make an arrest, if that's what you mean, sir. No, but it's pressuring you, Jimmy. I'm just interested. Yeah. I saw Mo the other day. Oh, yeah. Just happened to be passing her too, did you? Well, we had tea together. Cosy. She misses you. How about the dog? Did you talk to him? What? You seem to be covering every other department of my life. I thought you'd lose that chip in your shoulder when you got promotion, Jimmy. I'm coping very well with work and with life, thank you, sir, but I'm grateful for your interest. All right, Jimmy, we'll leave it at that for the moment. But you won't mind if I come in on Eric Roy with you, though, will you? For old time's sake. Be my guest. Hello, Eric. What you been doing out the back there? Unstitching labels off fur coats? Do the same since a human, Mr. Vogel. You know I've been straight for years now. Mm. Oh, hello, Mr. Fraser, too. What's up? Crayon Jewel's gone missing. Have you had this list, Eric? Bit the fire with it on Sunday. Lovely blaze. I always think toast tastes better done in front of an open fire. 
Don't you, Mr. Fraser? Oh, quite frankly, I prefer to see you roasting on one, Eric. Now, Steve. Anyone been offering you any of this gear? I told you. You've been straight for years, eh? But you've surely not been totally forgotten. Hmm? We know you're too pure and lily-white to take it, but people must still ask. It's a new generation now. You should know that. I work with the best, the cream. You've got to admit that. Fencing in evening dress, was it? And what you got now? Lunatics with sawn-off shotguns. They're so jumpy they'd blow your face off if you as much as sneeze. What else? Spotty kids who'd smash a window with a Ming vase because they are too lazy to use the door. Yes, you're right. Things aren't what they were. I don't think they ever were. What? What they were. No. You don't need to protect scum like that. Eh? Lunatics with shotguns. Spotty kids. Who's trying to shift this stuff, Eric? They'll have been here for sure because you're the best. You met my wife's mother? Fat woman owns the fish shop on William Street. The very same. I hate her more than anyone else on earth. So? I wouldn't tell you if her road text was out of date. Understand? How many times have I nicked you, Eric? Twice. Mm, so you know me by now. You come second to my mother-in-law. <laughs> Sometimes it's quite close. But you know the way I work. I don't offer bribes or incentives. No. You're all stick and no carrot. Exactly. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to go round and find every bright young GC who wants to impress me and get on the squad and tell him your number's up. Then I'm going to pay a visit to traffic and sort out a few disgruntled, bitter individuals who are aching for a transfer to greener pastures and you won't be able to park your mini on a yellow line for 30 seconds. That's always supposing it survived its spot checks for tyres and the like. By the time I'm finished, you won't even trust the lollipop man to see you across the road. That's harassment. Is it worth going through all that to protect someone you've got no respect for anyway? And they call us villains. I may be hard, Eric, but I'm practical too. I'd never try and put you in a witness box. Look, nobody need know you told us anything. We just want a lead. Come on, Eric, get it off your chest. I oh, sent them packing. Didn't take anything. We believe you. Thousands wouldn't. And I don't know any names. Descriptions would be a start. Two of them. Kids. I blame the parents, you know. <laughs> what they look like? Kids. They're all the same. Jeans, scruffy hair. Kids. That's not enough, Eric. One small, skinny, 14, 15, maybe younger. Cockney. The other one's older. Quite well spoken. Five foot seven or eight. Nice jacket. Hand stitched. Anything else? Nah, I told him to clear off. Same as I would you if I could. But there must be some way you could contact them if you decided you had a buyer later. I told them I wasn't interested. They wouldn't have given up that easy. And neither will I, remember? That was the only funny thing about it, really. Uh, they said I should put a lost budgie card in Carter's newsagent. Oh. <laughs> Not that old dodge. Exactly. Your boys would be round in ten minutes. But it shows that... Young as they are, they've got connections with someone who was active when that was a villain's post box. OK, I'm going up. Usual signal if you spot anyone. Mm. Mm. Bit of rust on the fixings there. Better watch it doesn't give way. Ooh. Easy does it. Easy does it. I don't like the feel of that. I wish that cloud would go back over the moon. Still, I'm glad of the light for the moment. Now that moss will be damp with the rain from last night. Better be careful. If I ease my foot onto that ledge, that's the way. Now, the question is, is the pipe going to take my weight? Oh, just about. There. Good. Now for the catch. I slip my penknife down that crag. Ah, nearly. Come on, beauty. That's it. Third time lucky. Second door on the left. Draw the 
curtains. Start at the bottom and work up. Better. I would have taken them off in the club, but <laughs> Dad, I'd have never have got them on again. <sighs> yeah, Mavis, did, did you shut the curtains before we left? Because I'm damn sure I didn't. <laughs> and there's been someone in while we've been gone. Mavis, Mavis, we've been burgled. Oh, hell. And one of the little two rags is still here. Catch the bag. I'm coming after. Uh, stop where you are, Sandy. You're not going anywhere. Don't you touch me. Ouch. Ouch. Mavis. Oh, nine, nine, nine. nine. Quick. <laughs> to be honest, I wasn't expecting it. I mean, he was only a slip of a kid and he caught me with a real one, too. Right and left to the stomach, and then bang. Lost two front teeth. You certainly got a hard head. Nerves of steel, too. I don't think I'd have tried getting down that way. Uh, blokes our age got a bit more weight to carry, eh? He was still lucky. He'd have bust his leg for sure if your carport hadn't broken his fall. He left a nice dent in the roof of the car, too. Did he get away with much? Oh, he didn't do too bad, I suppose, catching him at it. Lost a bit of jewellery of the wife's. It was given to her by her mother, so she's a bit upset, I'm afraid. Yeah, D.C. Blackett's looking after her. I don't think it's anything a nice cup of tea won't cure. Did you see the other one? Ah, uh, only a clean pair of heels. You can give us a good description of Henry Cooper, though. Well, afraid not. Had a spurs scarf round the bottom of his face. Blonde, small. I don't suppose that helps much. How about his voice? You said he shouted down. Caught me. Where's mate? Did he answer? Not a word. What's our chances of getting the jewellery back? Tell you that when we catch him. Blackie! Sir! Well, thank you for your cooperation, sir. We'll be in touch. All right. How'd you make out with his missus? Not very well. Her mother died last year. Cancer. And this brought it all back. Floods of tears. I never know what to do with them when they're like that. A couple of buckets of tea through a funnel is a standard solution. It didn't seem to help much. So you didn't get anything out of it? Mm-mm. And she hadn't seen the villains anyway. No. Got a description of the missing bits of jewellery? Mm, that was what started her off. She kept remembering where the old lady had given things to her and the good times they'd had there. She spent ten minutes going on about a lucky pixie on a charm bracelet. You know the sort of thing. Must have cost about a quid on the front at Brighton. Yet a diamond bracelet her husband gave her hardly got a mention. Funny things, people. She's a bit posher than him, isn't she? Well, that was the impression I got. Yes. Made his money from demolition. Must have sold out at the right time and retired around here. You're the one with the local knowledge. Anything to connect him with the others? Well, they haven't got any children. And the mare's in construction, so there might have been a connection sometime. But that's a bit thin when we're talking about jewellery. Yeah. I'll get this list circulated in the morning, shall I? Yeah, for what it's worth. They don't seem to be using any fence we know. Right, sir. Are we going back to the office now? Yeah. DC Walker can show the flag tonight. He knows what needs doing. Oh. Well, perhaps you could drop me off at the corner, sir. The tube station. I should be in time for the last train. Yeah, fine. Unless you'd like to come in for coffee. Eh? We're not far from my place. Of course, it was too late for you. No, not at all. But I'm just not sure how I'd get back. I'll give you a lift. Then I'd love her. Coffee, sir. You'll have to excuse the place. It's been a bit untidy again. I haven't had time to clear up. You should get yourself somewhere smaller. You know, one of those service flats. Oh, too pricey, aren't they? Couldn't manage on an inspector's money. Even with all that overtime on crime squad. Easy to run, though. Just drop your laundry down the chute, leave your washing up in the sink. <sighs> Sounds great, but I think I'll stay here. At least till I know 
which way things are going. It's only a trial separation, you see. Do you want to talk about it? <laughs> well, my wife doesn't understand me, that sort of thing. The trouble was she did. Understand me, that is. Only too well. That can be worse, you know. I see. Do you? I'd have thought you were a bit young to have gone through all that. Oh, look, don't patronise me. I don't have to put up with that. We're not on duty now. Are you saying I'm patronising when we are on duty? If you're a woman police officer, you get used to it. Oh, you're not going to start raising a woman's lib banner, are you? And why not? When whatever exalted rank we reach doesn't raise us off our backs, in the imagination of the average policeman. We can only have one ability, which is of any interest, and if you don't seem inclined towards that, you're written off as a lesbian. It's not that bad. No? I mean, you don't think I asked you here just because... No, it's not unknown. I felt like some company tonight. Like you said, this place is too big for me on my own. I get lonely, I suppose. Aww. It's all right. I'm not looking for sympathy. But after you've been married 14 years, you're bound to notice a difference. Mm, like your socks aren't washed and your meals aren't made. No, it's not that. I can always buy a new pair. There's a good Chinese takeaway on the bridge. Well, I got in about 11 last night, put on the late-night horror. Somehow it's only half the fun when you've got no-one to pull it to pieces with. Do you mean that thing where the boy came roaring out of his grave on a motorcycle? That's the one. Terrible, wasn't it? I watched it on my own, and it didn't spoil it. I fell off my chair laughing. <laughs> Maybe it's an attitude of mine, then. Yeah. You've got to stop thinking of women as just an extension of you. To laugh at your jokes and sympathise when you moan. Well, how should I think of them? Do you reckon I'm a hopeless case? Or can you still teach me? Shall I make you some breakfast, sir? You can't keep calling me sir. Not here, anyway. Oh, I see. It's darling between the sheets and sir or Mr Vogel in the office, eh? I'm getting too old to cope with this sort of thing. Well, you realise in your male chauvinist pig way you've never even told me your first name. Oh, it's Jimmy. Do you want any breakfast, Jimmy? I do know where everything is. Ah, uh, just coffee. Well, I hope you won't mind if I make myself something. I'm starving. Mm. I think there's a frozen pizza in the fridge. Would that suit? Got any cornflakes I can put on it? Eh? Forget it. That'll be fine. You didn't happen to notice where I left my razor? On the bookcase and the box is by the loo. Oh, char. Live with your parents, do you? Not anymore. You needed to be independent, I suppose. That's why you moved out. I didn't. They did. To the cemetery. Died within a few weeks of each other. Oh, sorry. It's all right. Happens to us all in the end. So you're all on your own? Not quite. My sister shares with me. She'll be worried about you not coming home last night. I doubt it. She's in Delhi. Jet setter? Air hostess. How long have you had this pizza? Dunno. I never eat them. Mo got it in for Tina. That's my daughter. Sell by December 78. Don't think I'll risk it. You're probably right. Shove it in the bin. God, when was this last emptied? I forgot to put it out last week. Is that how you usually carry on? Eh? Blowing hair all over the table. God, it's no wonder your wife couldn't stick you. Need taking in hand, do I? Mm, I'd say you were a hopeless case. Who the hell's that? Oh, don't worry. I'll do something tactful, like hiding under the sofa or climbing up the chimney. It's probably the milkman. Can't remember when I last paid in. Sorry, I couldn't find my key. It's a long time since I had to use it. Yeah. Hello, Daddy. Hello, love. God, you get bigger every week. You haven't forgotten, have you, Jimmy? What? I've got my driving test this afternoon. An hour's lesson before and then the test. Y you said you'd have Tina today instead of Sunday. Y yeah, no, I hadn't forgotten. I just uh, didn't expect to see you so early, that's all. Oh, good. So you're all fixed up. You're not expected at the office. It's fine. Perhaps you'd like to come in for coffee. I can't stop long. Got any orange? I don't think so. I'm sorry. Well, if you're happy with these statements, sir, I'll get them typed up. Only the superintendent wanted you to see them first. Uh, oh, oh, yes. Thanks, Blackie. This is my wife, Mo, and my daughter, Tina, by the way. Mm, pleased to meet you. This is Detective Constable Blackie. Hello. Can I have some money to go and buy some orange from the shop? 
Later, darling. I'll, I'll leave you some spending money. But there's no need for that, Mo. I can pay the kids orange. I prefer to do it myself. We manage all right, thanks. Yes. Well, I, I he ought to be getting back. We know you won't be in the office today, sir, but we'll phone you if there's any developments. Yes, thanks, Blackie. Goodbye, Mrs. Vogel. Tina. Bye. Pretty girl. Yeah, I suppose she is. Don't tell me you hadn't noticed. She's very good at her job. I'm glad to hear it. The coffee won't be long. Kettle's on, anyway. <coughs> uh, I don't think I'll bother after all, thanks, Jimmy. I, I've not got much time, and I'd like to get some shopping before the lesson. Oh. Well, perhaps you'll have a cup with me, Tina. I don't like coffee. I want orange. We'll go and get one later. I really insist on paying. OK. I'll, uh, I'll leave you two to it, then. Uh, mind you, behave yourself, Tina. I'll pick you up after lunch. OK, ma'am. Good luck, the test. Oh, yeah, good luck. Thanks. See you later, Jimmy. Bye. Well, then. What? How's school? It's half term. Otherwise, I'd be there today. Oh, yeah, but um, you get on all right? I suppose so. Good. Good. You still mates with that girl with the pigtails? What was her name? Uh, she still come calling for you? No. Oh. Well, I never liked her anyway. What's she going to do? Do? This morning. What would you like to do? Don't know. It's up to you. How about the science museum? Mum took me there in the holidays. Oh. It's boring. Isn't an Italian ice cream place just open by the station. We could stuff ourselves full of 15 different flavours. How about that? No, thanks. You can't be worrying about your figure at 11. You've got your whole life for that. If I start now, it won't be so difficult later. There's a certain chilling logic in that. You've got a lot of your mother in you. That's funny. She says I've got a lot of you in me. I think you both just mean I'm irritating. Miss you, you know. Both of you. Do you? Do you think... Kettle's boiling. Yeah. is not much about the orange. I'll have coffee with you instead. You don't like coffee. I don't mind it sometimes. <laughs> Two coffees coming up then. I was going to ask... What case are you working on now? Hey? We chased in some lorry hijackers last time we talked about it. Have you got them? Nah. They're still on the books, but they seem to move their attentions up country now. One case might interest you. Series of break-ins. We reckon it's kids. Probably not much older than you. Girl in my class had a dinner money pinched a couple of weeks ago. Get the whole class in, but no one owned up. Yeah, well, this is a bit more serious than dinner money. Stealing, stealing, whatever the amount. That's what Mummy says. She's right, of course. Your mum usually is. Even when she's talking about you? Especially then. She talk about me a lot. Sometimes. What's she say? Why don't you ask her? Because it's easier to ask you, I suppose. Then you ought to ask her. You should never take the easy way out. She says that too. She would. Are we going to do anything or are we just going to stop in talking all day? Yes, well, uh, it's very, very kind of you to come in like this, Mr Harris. I'm sure you're a busy man. Uh, don't worry, don't worry. I want to see them put away. Too many kids around here think they can get something for nothing. They've got to be taught a lesson. Yes. Oh, well, what was going on to my missus about it? They have it too easy these days, you know. It's not like when I was a lad. No, it's quiet. Well, uh, what do you think of the picture now? Has our resident Picasso done him justice? Yes, well... Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, like I told the inspector, it was all over in a few seconds. But yeah, it's a pretty fair likeness. Oh, good. I always think it gives our lads a boost to be looking for a face instead of a vague description. Well, thank you again for your help, Mr. Harrison. Is that all? Um, yes, I think so, for the moment. You'll let me know what progress you're making. Mm, yes, of course. I'll try to do better. Get your property back. <laughs> your inspector didn't seem to think there was a lot of chance of that. Uh, I suppose they might already have flogged it. Well, it depends how professional they are, what contacts they've got. Oh, then we've got no chance. I've watched them hanging about on street corners, and those sort of jobs have got nothing to do but learn villainy. I reckon that's half the problem. Yes, I suppose so, yeah. Devil finds work for idle hands. Uh, that's as true now as when I was a boy. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you, you take the lads I was with last night. Salt of the earth. 
They've too many interests to be getting into mischief all the time. You know what I mean? Uh, this would be the uh, prize giving you mentioned. Yeah, that's right, that's right. The Morgan Street Boys Club. Oh, I'm on the committee. It's all voluntary work, you know, but I get more out of it than I ever did the business. Yes. <laughs> nice to know you're doing good. Yes, quite. Now, this was, um, this was a long-standing arrangement. Hmm? I mean, a lot of people would have known that you were giving out the prizes last night. Well, of course. Of course I do it every year. <laughs> oh, no. You're barking up the wrong tree if you think there's a connection. Now, those lads respect me. They, they'd never turn my place over. Maybe... But it only needs one boy to boast about the prize he's getting. And his mates could work out that your place is left empty for the evening. Yes, Jimmy, I looked in at the office, but you weren't there. No. Wanted to see what progress you've been making. It, yeah, well, it was Moe's driving test. Oh, yeah. I said I'd look after Tina. I've put in 50 hours already this week. Yes, week, I'm sir. sure you have, Jimmy. There's no need to be so touchy. Sorry, sir. How'd it go? Hey, eh? The test. Oh, she passed. Good. Do give her my congratulations when you see her. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Anyway, I'm sure you'll be pleased to know that I've not been idle in your absence. In fact, I seem to have solved your case for you. Pardon, sir? Now, you arranged for Mr. Harris to come in and see a police artist uh, do a picture of his uh, visitor. Yes, sir. Just mm. routine. I didn't think I needed to be there. Quite. But as I was there, I got chatting to him. and He mentioned the Morgan Street Boys Club... Uh, well, I pricked up my ears straight away. I was aware of his connection with the club, sir. It's in my report. Indeed it is, Inspector. What you do not seem to have been aware of is that it is the link you've been looking for. I, I made a few phone calls this morning. It didn't take long for a pattern to emerge. Now, as you already noted, most of our victims have teenage sons. All but two of them are members of the club. Of the others, one has mates there. The girl's boyfriend is a member, and we can even cover Tony Sutton. I'd have thought he was a bit upmarket for Morgan Street. Yes, quite, but they've got a very well-equipped weight-training room which he uses in the holidays. He's a school boxing champion, remember? Maybe it was him hit Mr. Harris, then. Well, apart from the fact he's a foot too tall, it might have been. No, I think Tony's trouble is his mouth, not his fists. A careless word when he's doing his bench press and the mare gets turned over the next night. It all fits. Like a jigsaw puzzle. And nothing political. Well, I don't suppose it'll take you long to tie up the loose ends. Now, go through the membership. There's a couple of rotten apples in there somewhere. One or both with criminal connections, and neither of whom turned up for the price-giving. How big's the membership? Or oh, just over 800. Be a doddle, then, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, if you could get things sewn up for the weekend, I'd be grateful. We need you back. We're snowed under at the moment. I'll do my best, sir. Sure, I go. Now, delegate as much as you can. Especially the legwork. That's what the DCs are for. And don't let them take advantage of you. Keep your distance. I know how to handle DCs, sir. I was one myself long enough. Oh, you're very sensitive today, Jimmy. I thought you'd be grateful for my help and advice. Well, never mind. I'll uh, see you at the weekend, I hope. So, only about 60 kids turned up for the prize giving, eh? <laughs> Not very keen, are they? Hmm. That's less than 8% of your membership. Not the active membership. Come on. Now, you've obviously not had a lot of experience with boys' clubs. No. That list includes anyone who's paid his 50 pence membership fee. Some of them come once and never come back. Doesn't that worry you? Not really. We've got a lot of sections, see? We run four football teams, for instance, but our standard's very high. Few kids get discouraged when they find they're not going to get picked. <laughs> Then there are those who are disappointed because the judo section, the karate section, and the weightlifting can't turn them into the incredible Hulk overnight. <laughs> There's a lot of hard work involved. Yeah, and that puts them off, eh? Quite often. Unfortunately, we've bred a generation of kids whose exercise doesn't usually stretch much further than changing channels on the TV. <laughs> it's hard to shift that attitude. Well, most kids seem to have the energy to kick in phone boxes, from what I've seen. That's just the mindless few. If you stick them in tower blocks with nothing to do, what do you expect? Well, personally, sir, I expect them to behave themselves, because they're a darn sight better off than being in the slums. It's a question of being involved. If a lad is into something, he's happy. The real problem is getting him started. Yes, well, I think I'll get the picture. So how many of these are what you'd call active members, eh? Just the 60 that came for the prize giving? <laughs> no, far from it. I can't blame anyone for not wanting to hear Mr. Harris's speech. It's the same every year. 
I wouldn't have come myself if I didn't have to. I see. I'd say that anyone who comes here once a month or more is an active member. There's probably about 200 of those. And would you know all of them personally, sir? Not really. Only the ones who do table tennis, rock climbing or judo. Uh, Those are my specialisations, you see. But of those you do know, are you aware of any with criminal connections? Been in bother or got older brothers or fathers who have? No, I'm not, and I wouldn't want to be. I trust my lads, and they trust me. And I don't intend to let this investigation spoil that. Well, I must say, I find all this rather disturbing. I've always thought the club did an excellent job. Well, no one's suggesting anything different, Sam. Really? From what you've said, it sounds like Fagin's kitchen. Not at all. We're just considering the possibility that our villains may have been acting on information overheard, chance remarks, at the club. Mm. We're probably talking about one boy from a membership of 800. Even the police force will be hard put to guarantee that percentage of rotten apples. Mm. Well, what do you think, Tony? Could you have let something slip? I don't know. Can't remember. Why don't you put bugging devices in the dumbbells, Superintendent? Look, it may seem pointless, but I want you to try and remember. Now, I don't know a great deal about weightlifting, but I don't imagine there's a lot of opportunity for small talk during a serious session. Is there anywhere else in the club where you come into contact with people? Canteen, maybe? They run their own coffee bar, though. And you'd spend some time at this bar when you are at the club? Mm, Not through choice. And if that's where the information came from, the laugh would be on Dad. <laughs> the, um, the coffee bar is run by the boys themselves. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Well, they all put in a bit of time there, cutting sandwiches, washing up, whatever they're asked to do. Mm-hmm. I was made aware of the fact that Tony wasn't pulling his weight. Mm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So I persuaded him to join in more. Rubbish. It was just inverted snobbery. Dad's got this thing about me mixing with all sorts. He unloads his... Hang-ups on me. Yes, well, the, um, hmm? the public school is still the best education available in this country, but I sometimes worry that it may give our children a rather one-dimensional view of humanity. Mm-hmm. That's why I encourage Tony to widen his circle of acquaintances. <sighs> but you'd never catch him slumming it. Now, look, I don't think all this is uh, entirely relevant. I just need to know whether you might have said something in the coffee bar or anywhere else that might have led to the break-in here. I should think it's very possible, and I intend to be even more indiscreet in future. They'll be queuing up outside. Not everyone finds your sort of humour amusing, Tony. Oh, that's all right, Mr Sutton. I think I've got all the information I need now. Evening, Mrs. What do you want? Chat. Steve won't be out for 18 months yet, and he's all you ever ask about, so there's nothing to say. How are you managing without him? Same as usual. A lot of washing there. Must be hard, coping with the family. I'll get by. Yep. I suppose you're more used to him being away than at home. You lot see to that. He brings it on himself by always getting into mischief. It's our wedding anniversary next week. 16 years. Do you know how much he spent of that at home? Seven. Nine years in Nick, and another 18 months to go if he keeps his nose clean. It's hardest on your boy, I suppose. Jerry, it's the one thing keeps me going. He's turning out all right, even if it is all stacked against him. I'm glad to hear it. Mind you, it must be difficult. Boy that age needs a father. Oh, sometimes I think he's best off without him. Must be 14 now, isn't he? June. Now, the couple of years he'll be out, bringing you a wage in. He's doing that now. Um, paper round in the morning, Saturday at the green grocers. We couldn't manage without. Where is he tonight? Playing football, probably. No harm in that. Why all these questions about Jerry? Nothing to worry about, just routine. I've heard that before with his dad. Usually ends up with me not seeing him for two years. It's to do with the club he goes to, that's all. You seeing all the members? We may have to in time, yes. But not yet. So how come Jerry's top of the list? He's never been in any trouble. Never. You should see his school report. OK, he's not bright, but they all say he works harder than anybody. Look, no one's accusing him of anything, Mrs. The sins of the father, eh? Just tell him we'd like to talk to him. I'll call round again.
Here, have you seen that notice? What notice? How old are you? Eighteen. What happened? Gin stunt your growth. Runs in the family. Mum's little, dad's little. Only one's got any size is my Uncle Albert. And he looks like a Milton. Well, that's enough of your cheek on your bike. Got any jobs want doing? No. It doesn't take Bulgarian coins, just ten big bits, okay? I'll drop this. Yeah, about the jobs. You still here? I could be useful around the place. Sweeping up, cleaning up. All I need is a bouncer. Keep the likes of you out. Straight up. I'll turn my hands or anything. Give us a chance. Well, I've got a couple of storerooms upstairs. Everything's got to be shifted out of the big one and stacked in the other. Governor's opening a rifle range up I'll there. I'll do it for you. Oh, I don't know. They're heavy, them machines. I've done weight training. Look at that muscle. <laughs> At least give me a try. Well, if anyone comes round, parents, law, anyone, I don't know you. I don't know how you got in here, right? Seems me. Can I keep in the storeroom? I mean, give her an inch, she wants a flaming mile. I really won't be no trouble. All right, as long as I don't know about it. Thanks. Oh, what's my wages? Wages? I'm not doing it for charity, you know. They put that bloody machine down, tunnels in the real rat, understand? Oh, yeah, you do that, man. Two quid of it's done neat, quit round the year otherwise. Two fifty. I don't haggle, sunshine. Two quid and nothing. Now come over to the cash desk. You mean I'll get it in advance? You must be joking. I'd never see you again. No, thought I'd unload me sandwiches on you. Didn't fancy them tonight. Cheese and pickle again. Cheers. I'm going. Now up the stairs. You'll see the storerooms on your right. You might as well get started straight away. Fine. Got a watch? Yep. If you come down about ten, I'll be brewing up. You can join me in a cup. What's the idea of coming to see me at work? You're trying to lose me my job? Where's Jerry? At school, I imagine. No, he isn't, and you know it. They phoned you this morning, and you said he was down with a flu. But there's no one at your place either. You told him to clear off, didn't you? I never even saw him. No. He didn't come home last night. I was worried sick. Then why didn't you report him missing? Because it's obvious what's happened, isn't it? He's heard you're after him and the poor kid's scared stiff. If he's done nothing, there's nothing to worry about. Don't make me laugh. You've marked his card and he knows it. He's seen it happen to his dad enough times. The only thing that's marked his card is the fact that he's done a bunk. Up till then, he was just one name on a list. Have you got any photos of him? You think I'm going to help you find him? He's a 14-year-old boy loose in London with nowhere to sleep. If he's not in bother now, there's 101 ways he soon will be. Maybe that doesn't worry you, but I think he'd ought to. If it was my kid... Oh, he'd... yeah, but it wouldn't be, would it? Because your kid was born on the right side of the law. Are you going to give me those pictures? I haven't got any. What do you expect? Holiday snaps? We don't go on holidays. Any extra money comes in goes on little luxuries like food and clothes. Look, Mrs Marshall, I know you don't believe me, but I really want to find the boy for his own sake. Oh, yeah. You'd have him put into care for his own sake too, wouldn't you? Well, wherever he is, I reckon he's better off than he would be with you helping him. So this is where you're hiding out, is it? For a while, yeah. A bit grotty. Too clean. Yes, I suppose it would. Jerry, it never occurred to you that running off like that was about the most stupid thing you could have done. You reckon? Oh, it's obvious. Some bright spark worked out there was a connection with the club. That's all. Policemen are too thick to have two strokes of genius in a century. So if you'd just stayed put, we'd have been laughing. As it is, you might just as well have sent in a written confession. You don't know what it's like. I was top of the list because of me, Dad. Oh, don't flatter yourself. Or him. You're hardly son of Al Capone. Wherever you were, it was a long list and you felt them scrub off the rest. Well, it's done now and that's the end of it. Did you bring the money? <laughs> you don't mean they're charging rent for this place, do you? Look, come on, I'm entitled. Must have been four or five hundred quid's worth. Yes, well, that's a bit on the optimistic side, I'm afraid. How much, then? I don't know yet. I'm seeing him this afternoon. Well, I need something now. Well, you'll have to wait. Unless you want to take over the fencing arrangements again. I can't afford the risk now. You know that. Yes, well, not to mention I'm much better at it. I'll give you your share tonight when we turn over the Ferguson's. You what? You hadn't forgotten about it, had you? We can't do it now. Why not? Because they're on to us, that's why. They're not on to us. They're on to you. And since you've done your disappearing act, they're unlikely to expect you to pull a job locally. Well, I still think it's risky. We ought to leave it for a bit. Yes, well, 
Unfortunately, the Fergusons only have one wedding anniversary a year. And I'm not prepared to wait for the next. Well, maybe you're not, but I'm the one that's sticking his neck out. Oh, Jerry, it'll be a doddle. There's not even any climbing. Ma and Pa go out for their celebration dinner, leaving Jim doing his homework. <laughs> or so they think. They've told him he's not to go to Best Party, but of course he will. He'll go out the back way so as to avoid the nosy neighbours, and that's how we get in. Mm, what? Well, supposing he's more scared of his parents than he lets on, and he doesn't go to the party. Oh, he'll go. I'm taking rounds of cans of beer at eight, and we're going on there together. Once I've got him safely engaged and chatting up the local talent, I'll step out, and we're on our way. Mm, I don't know. Sorry to bother you again, sir. Oh, that's all right. I want to see this business cleared up as much as you do. Uh, I had intended to be here earlier, but I had a meeting with the ACC, and it seems to gone forever. <laughs> well, I'm not going out tonight anyway. Drink? Uh, scotch, please. Ice? Yes. Uh, thank you. I gather you've made some progress. Tony tells me there's a lot of talk at the club. As a matter of fact, it was Tony I wanted to see. Is he in tonight? No, I'm afraid not. He's at a friend's house, and then they're going on to a party. Ah. There you are. Oh, thank you. You'll yes. forgive me for not joining you. Cheers. But I've got a report to study tonight, and I need a clear head for it. <laughs> Was it anything I could help you with? Well, it's a very minor matter. One of the boys in the club has disappeared after he'd heard that we were asking questions about him. Naturally, we're anxious to trace him. I'm sure you are. I take it you're satisfied that he's the culprit. Well, it's not my job to judge the case, sir, but I can tell you in confidence that... Mr. Harris has identified him from a picture as the boy that broke into his house. Oh, jolly good. I'm glad there's some light at the end of the tunnel. Well, how could Tony help you? Well, I'm not sure he can, but um, the club leader mentioned that Tony had given the boy some boxing tips. Apparently, some of the younger lads rather hero-worship him, so he helps out with the teacher. Yes, I know. Yes, I'm very pleased about it. Mm. As I told you, I'm keen for Tony to mix well, make a contribution. <laughs> Even if on this occasion it did have rather unfortunate consequences. How do you mean? Well, you're the detective, but I would have thought it was obvious. Tony got chatting to the boy, trying to put him at his ease, and said rather more than he should have done. Ah, uh, I see. Still, in the end, it won't have done too much harm. The insurance will cover most of the loss. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Where'd you keep his cups? What? Tony. He's won quite a few, hasn't he? Yes. Well, they're in his room. Did you want to see them? No. Later, perhaps. He must be very proud of them all, hmm? <laughs> He's got every reason to be. Yes, quite. Still, perhaps the novelty of winning them wears off. I don't quite understand what you're getting at. I was wondering why he didn't bother to turn up for the one that was presented at the boys' club. But he did. You can see it in his room. Another boy collected it for him. Didn't you know? He might have mentioned it. I don't remember. Well, never mind. Perhaps you'll ask him to give me a ring sometime. Hmm? Help tidy up the loose ends. He'll be back in about half an hour, I should think. You pick him up before he gets inside, eh? I don't want nothing to do with it. Yeah, OK. Thanks for your help. How long's he been here? Well, like I told the beat lad, he just arrived today. Told me he was looking for a job. Look, I'm grateful to you, and I'll mention that to the local Nick, so if you have any trouble, you'll start in credit. But I need to know his movements, what he's been up to since he opted. It's not for publication, so there'll be no harm done. Uh, he's been here three days. I liked him at first, but, well, I don't see why I should protect him now. What did he do to get up your nose? I came back last night with a stack of money. I know these kids see enough in here every night. There's only one way they get that sort of bread. Hey. Peddling H. Fourteen-year-old kid? I oh, don't sound so surprised. You must see it all the time. There you are. Drug squad, ain't you? No, crime squad. What's he done, then? Housebreaking. You wouldn't have told me if you'd known, would you? I don't suppose I would. <laughs> it's the one thing that gets me, see? Oh, I've fished them out of the bogs when they've messed it. Old-age pensioners of fourteen and up. It's such a stupid bloody waste. Yeah. Oh, I know what you're thinking. What does he know about waste? Sweeping between the slot machines. He's never done anything with his life. Well, I have, see. Not as I'd care to tell you about, but maybe a damn sight better than finishing off your childhood with a dirty needle. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad the kid wasn't into all that anyway. You uh, 
You won't tell them it was me grasped them? No, of course not. It might work out for the best for him, you know. Yeah, what? I mean, if uh, someone can set him right now. Oh, who do you think you are, Billy Graham? Just pull him in and worry about your crime figures like the rest of them. Back again? Yes, I'm sorry to call so late, but I'm afraid it is rather urgent. Well, surely you could have waited till the morning. I don't think so. Well, you'd better come in, I suppose. Thank you. Now, what's it all about? Do you ever read this magazine, sir? Zeo? It's a scandal, my green rag. Hardly my cup of tea. Well, I imagine we'll be seeing a lot more of this edition. It's the one that comes out tomorrow. A mate of mine, Spectre, let him have it. He was delighted. Always said it was political. I'm still not convinced. What are you talking about, Superintendent? Uh, article on page 10. Dealing with a time when you were at the Department of the Environment. Under the counter deals. The coincidence is that three of the people named had their houses broken into recently, including yourself. Now, have you any idea where the magazine got their information from? Yes, well, thank you very much for bringing this to my attention, Superintendent. But as it's obviously a matter for my legal advisers, I think we'll leave it there. Well, as you wish, sir, uh, but uh, there is another matter I have to deal with. Really? Yes, there's a boy at the police station at the moment helping us with our inquiries into your and other break-ins. Now, it'd be useful if we could speak to Tony at the same time. Is he home tonight? I'm afraid not. Well, we've been talking to some of the other boys, taking statements. The way we see it... <laughs> There must have been at least two boys involved. So there's still one on the loose? Hmm. How much pocket money does Tony get, sir? That's none of your damn business. <laughs> well, I'm sorry you feel like that about it, sir. What did you want to know for, anyway? Just routine. One of the lads we're interested in has been spending a bit of money. Sort of thing's bound to attract attention in a case like this, especially when he hasn't had a job for a few months. I see. He says Tony bought his motorcycle. Is that true, sir? I don't know. You better wait until you can ask it. Oh, come on, Mr. Sutton. Even in a progressive household like this, you must know when your son spends nearly £300 on a machine which he's not even allowed to use legally for another year. Or don't you bring him up to have any respect for the law of the land? He can drive it legally at our cottage. We've private land. So now you're saying that you did know that he'd bought the bike? I'm not saying anything until I've taken legal advice. Yes, well, that's probably very wise, sir, especially in view of this magazine article. I take it that young Master Tony will have a similar attitude, hmm? If he ever returns, that is. It's never right, you know. Eh? The way you lot carry on. Just because my old man's inside, you think you can forget about the rules. That's not true, Mrs. I've explained your rights to you. Everything's been kosher. Knock hell. Kid's tired, you can see that. He'd admit to anything now just to get it over with. Oh, I wish I could make you see sense, missus. I don't need him to admit anything. I've got him sewn up tighter than a Scotsman's wallet already, but that's not what I want. Eh? He didn't do this on his own. There were papers, Nick. Someone passed them on to Zayo, not Jerry. B knows more his mark. Why should he carry the can for the lot? You just want him to help you fit somebody else up. Do you want to see him taken away from you? Not up to me, is it? Or me, but I can put in a word. Lark hell. I mean it. Now, Jerry, are you going to tell me who put you up to this? Nothing to say. Don't get cheeky with me, son, because you're in trouble. Real trouble. You may think you're a little hard nut, but I've seen them all in here, all shapes and sizes, and they're not half so cocky when they get in front of the beak. What's he like at home? He's never the slightest trouble. Ah, don't give me that. It's not easy keeping him in hand with his dad inside. Well, someone's got to do it, or he'll be spending the rest of his life in and out of Nick, just like his old man. Is that what you want, son? Jerry, the big-time crook. Well, I can tell you now, it's not the way it's going to be. We've got your card marked, son. We'll be looking for you. I can see your future stretched out, getting crummier and crummier every year. Not the mafia... You'll be a gas meter specialist, a handbag snatcher, a bloke who'll nick a radio and a handful of coppers when he spots the kitchen door open. Yeah, 
when you start getting a beer paunch, you'll not be able to climb the drain pipes anymore, even if you don't break a leg first. Tat. Rubbish. That's your future. A few quid when you get away with it, and back in the nick again when you don't and we collar you. There'll be none of these 3,000 quid touches for you, because you haven't got the brains to plan them yourself. Oh, you'll keep hoping. But the silver lining won't come. Just the convictions. And then you'll be back in the cell with the rest of the mugs, putting up with a stench that makes your outside bog smell like Devon violets, scrounging for fags, learning a few new tricks that'll get you back in here quicker than you could say knife. Is that what you want? Is that what you've got planned for yourself? What choice has he got? What do you want of him? I told you! I know he didn't set these up. If he helps me, I'll help him. That's a promise. You better tell him, Jerry. Nothing to say. Oh. Penny for him. Not much of a bargain, I'm afraid. Is it all right if I join you, sir? Pull up a chair. Don't usually see you in the canteen, sir. You usually eat in your office or the pub. I've had more hot dinners in police canteens than you've had hot dinners. Yes, sir. Oh, I wish they'd turn the eggs. I hate to see the yolks staring up at me. <sighs> You're all so young. Pardon, sir? Bits of kids. PCs, DCs, even flaming sergeants. So young. Not especially, sir. I was never that young, you know. Not even when I was on the beat. In fact, I don't think I was that young at school. Not that my memory works well enough to be sure these days. But I have a sneaking suspicion I'd duck P.E. to hide my middle-aged spread. And I saved my pocket money for the mortgage and... I'm going on a bit, aren't I? Perhaps you got out of bed the wrong side this morning. Yep, perhaps I did. You ought to be cheerful. After all, we've cracked the case. You reckon? Definitely. You've got more than enough for a conviction, even if the beaks are wishy-washy do-gooder. I don't know that, but it's not down to Jerry. Oh, I know he went up the drain pipes and through the windows he took all the risk. But he hasn't got the brains for the planning. You can see that in two minutes. So what? He still committed a crime. He's still guilty. Yeah, but... We'll get the other one soon enough. I suppose you'll be back to crime squad, then, once you've dotted the I's and crossed the T's. That's all right. That's a pity. I've enjoyed working with you, sir. Thanks. Yeah, perhaps we'll get the chance to work together again sometime. Maybe. I'd like that. Mind you, I expect it'll be me calling you sir by then, the way you're going. And that wouldn't be quite the same, would it? Oh, let's get on with it, shall we? I'm getting bored just sitting here. I'm ready when you are, Mr. Sutton. I thought we were waiting for your legal advisor. I don't need any solicitor to tell me what to say. My innocence is my protection. As you wish. Is that all right, Mr. Sutton? Well, he won't listen to me or Charles. He's determined to do things his own way. Well, unlike Daddy, I've got nothing to hide. You read these allegations in Zeo, then? Yes. Ironic, isn't it, that someone who goes on so much about fair play and moral values should be involved in fixing contracts and under-the-counter deals. If it's true, yes. You seem almost pleased at his discomfort. Oh, do I? Now, you surely didn't ask Tierney here to talk about my husband. No, not exactly. Where did you get the money for your motorcycle from, Tony? I won it. How? Plain tiddlywinks. Do you want that put in your statement? Don't tell me it's incriminating. Is it illegal playing tiddlywinks for high stakes? What's the maximum penalty? Now, I'm going to ask you once more... You really more. haven't got much sense of humour, have you, Superintendent? Dad lent it to me. He never mentioned it before. Hmm, must have slipped his mind. I'm sure he'll confirm it if you ask him. Will he? I wonder why. <laughs> Funny thing, the memory. Isn't it? Now, look, here's a list of dates, times, and a pencil. I want you to write down where you were on each of them. Oh, I'll do my best. But I can't usually remember where I was three hours ago, let alone three months. Then start thinking. 
Because it could prove to be important to you. I'll be back. After that, somebody will hear. Ah, just had Inspector Vernon on, special branch. Got to pass everything over, have we? Just the opposite. We've got a free hand. They've been aware of the something material for a while. Apparently it was peddled around Fleet Street straight after the break-in. No <sighs> takers. What is that? Well, it may seem mucky, but it's not enough to stand up in court. I see. So if Sutton doesn't sue, which he won't, it might all die down quietly. That's about it. Of course, if he was a real gentleman, he'd resign. But Vernon doesn't reckon that, so he'll be safe. Till there's a reshuffle or an election. Can Special Branch confirm that it was Tony who was trying to sell the story? Description fits, but that's no help to us. After all, if Sutton never admitted any letters were stolen, we can hardly do his son for nicking them. Uh, especially since he now seems keen to alibi Tony for anything. I don't get that. If it was me, I'd wring the little blighter's neck. Uh, except he's clever. I reckon he's got a bit more up his sleeve, and if Dad doesn't play ball, that goes to the papers too. Insurance. Yes, well, there's something giving him confidence. I'm not worrying him at all. What really niggles me is the little sods laughing at us. All we've got left is forensics or a cough from your little chum. No chance. What's you going to do about him anyway? Well, we'll push to have him put somewhere safe. Do we have to, oh, sir? Oh, come on, Jimmy. We can't have him trotting round the West End again. Yeah, I know how you feel, but it's a tough old world. Some people have to learn that younger than others. OK, Jerry, we've had your statement typed up. What there is of it, you've read it, your mother's read it. Before we call it a day, I'd like to have one last try at getting at the truth. He's tired. Can't you see that? We're all tired, Mrs. It's not right. You keep badgering him until he won't know what he's saying. There's rules about that sort of thing. <sighs> all right. I won't ask him to say anything for a bit. I'll talk. I'll tell him a story. Hey. Oh, it's OK. It's not Goldilocks and the Three Bears. I know he's past that. I want to go hard. Well, hard luck. You're going to listen. I know how you feel about Jax. Because I was brought up to feel the same. Oh, don't get me wrong. My family weren't villains. Not really. But nobody else on our road ever joined the force. It was like joining the enemy, see? There's mates of my dad's who still edge away if I go in the old local. You get used to it. My first nick was in a bundle outside the Green Man on Robert Street. This bloke was about to get stuck in with a bottle when I grabbed him. You know what? The other one gets off the floor and it's me after I'd just saved him. Funny old world, isn't it? There is. I'd have been in real trouble, but an old fellow helped me out, name of Bernie. Another funny thing, I nicked him that night too. You what? Had to, really. He asked me to. Drunk and disorderly that time. But over the next few years, I did him for all sorts. Gas meters, handbags, TDA. Always very polite, you know, never any trouble. Of course, nowadays, the force is dead modern and we learn about psychology and the like. So now I could tell you that Bernie was a recidivist, a habitual criminal. Couldn't cope with the pressures outside, you see. So he kept heading back to prison like an old home in Pigeon. No, I didn't know that then. I just thought he was a poor, tired old fella who wanted somewhere warm to sleep with regular meals thrown in. What's all this got to do with me? When I got into CID, I lost touch with Bernie. Well, I'm not pretending that worried me. But I did think about him at all. I imagined he was snug in his job in the prison library or someone else was nicking him for petty offences. It was a bad winter in 63. Before your time, of course. Lots of snow. I was out looking for a kid who'd absconded from Ballstall. I saw something by the road. I thought it was a dog. People often throw them out after Christmas, you know, unwanted presents. It wasn't a dog. It was Bernie. Stiff as a board and dead as a doornail. For once, he'd not had the money to get drunk and disorderly, and not even got the strength to break a window. I couldn't get time off for the funeral, so I don't suppose anybody went. Tony Sutton's next door, Jerry. He's going to get the best legal advice going. And I can tell you now that the word will be to drop you in the shit. No one's going to help you, son. Like my mate Bernie. Like your dad. 
You've got to learn to help yourself. You wanted to see me, sir? Ah, uh, yes, Jimmy. Ah, uh, hi, Jack. Our friends seem to be moving south again. A couple of container loads of scotch just outside Wapping. Got one of the drivers in the local nick supposed to have been beaten up, but it smells fishy. Get down there, will you? Yes, sir. The soccer will be around to give you the gin. Right. But didn't uh, Big Harry have something for you on it a little while back? Yeah, it was pretty vague. I didn't reckon it. Well, you know your snouts, but I'd have thought it was worth pushing. Why don't you pay him a visit tomorrow? I'm in court till the morning, sir. Well, so that shouldn't take too long. No, sir. Oh, uh, by the way, we're only doing Tony Sutton for receiving. You what? We'll get a guilty plea. I promised Jerry we'd be square with him. That's why he coughed. Well, you haven't broken your word. We're being quite fair. He only gave us enough to prove Tony had handled the goods. Organised selling. There's nothing to tie him to the scene of the crime. That's Jerry's word. Which might not stand. If we tried to put the lot on Master Sutton, his brief will make it look like he's been led astray. It'll probably be even worse for Jerry. I don't reckon it. Well, what's he got now? One break in, the rest taken into consideration. A couple of guilty pleas and it's all over in minutes. Well, you must admit that the longer it goes on, the worse it'll look for him. Maybe. It wasn't my decision, Jimmy. But I see the sense in it. Because it clears up the figures tidily, which is all that matters. Jimmy? I've not caught it a bad time, have I? Depends what you want. I don't know, really. Want to come in? So. Don't mind if I finish my ironing, do you? Go ahead. Where's Tina? Violin lesson. Still doing that, is she? How's she getting on? Same as before. She doesn't do quite so much practice. Must be a relief. Why don't you make yourself useful and put them on the frame as I finish them? Yeah, OK. It was the job, wasn't it? Eh? It's been a bad week. I've been thinking about things. I've worked it all out. Oh, yeah? I mean, what really used to get you down was not knowing when I was coming home and then having to put up with me droning on about villains when I did. That did have something to do with it, yeah. Would it help if I put my papers in? You couldn't give up the force. I can't. I told you I've been thinking about things. What would you do? Go into security? Maybe. Maybe I'd do something quite different. It wouldn't work. I'd make it work. That's what you want. Oh, don't blame it on me. That's why I'm doing it. I don't want you to do anything for me. Don't you understand? I'm saying I want you and Tina to come back. And if you do, I'll put in my papers. And I'm saying that I don't want to come back on those terms. It's too much of a responsibility, Jimmy. Being a jack is your life. How long would it be before you started resenting me for taking it away from you? Well, what do you want, then? I want... I want a little kindness. I want you to notice that I might have had a long day, too. I want you to surprise me, sometimes when it isn't my birthday or our anniversary and... You haven't been rude to one of my friends. I want to feel that I matter to you, not like the desk or the table or the rest of the furniture, but as a person in my own right. I want you to care. Not so as you write me poems or sonnets or sing me love songs, but so as once in a while you tell me I want so many things that I know you're incapable of giving me. Would you accept sorry? It would be a start. Sorry? I never could drive a hard bargain. In Sins of the Father by Bill Lyons, the part of Superintendent Fraser was played by Nigel Hawthorne and Inspector Vogel by Douglas Livingstone. Diana Bishop played Mo and Tina Lyons, Tina. Joe Blackett, Jenny Twigg. Dave Walker, Brian Carroll. Charles Sutton, Philip Voss, Mrs. Sutton, Petra Davis, Tony, Merlin Ward. Jerry Marshall, Dominic Cox, 
Mrs. Marshall, Eva Stewart, the gaffer, John Bott. Harris, Geoffrey Siegel, Walt, David Sinclair, Eric Roy, Fred Bryant, and the mayor, Brian Haynes. The play was directed by Jane Morgan. Clear autumn day near Malmö, southern Sweden. Sigbrick Maud, a tall, sturdy woman in her late thirties, stands patiently at a country bus stop. She's thinking about what she'll have for dinner and about what she's going to wear when a car draws up. Hello. I was waiting for the bus. Can you give me a lift home? Sigbrick gets in the car and it drives off. The bus she was waiting for comes half an hour later. By the time it arrives, Sigbrick Maud is already dead. In Stockholm, at half past nine the same night, Martin Beck, head of the National Murder Squad, and his colleague, Detective Inspector Colbert, are sitting in a patrol car outside a block of flats. In fact, both of them are far too senior to be doing any kind of surveillance, but Martin Beck often feels the need to be actively involved in policing, and Colbert is only too happy to accompany him. The friendship between the two men goes back a long way. Bloody hell, I'm bored. And I'm dying for something to eat. I can't remember when I last had a really good meal. He's still on that hard-boiled egg diet. What do you think? Oh, I could do with a cigarette. I thought you'd given up. I have. It doesn't stop me wanting one. Do you really think the bread man's in there? If he's not, we're going to look like fools. He's a nasty piece of work. Let's hope he's not armed. Are you? Only with that replica. You know how I feel about guns. You? I've got my Valter. I really don't want to use it. <sighs> what is it? Not enough oxygen in this car. It's claustrophobic sitting in here like this. When he comes out of the flat, we need to be very careful. The chief wants him in custody at any price. He doesn't like the idea of a killer on the loose. The chief's balmy. They've not found the jewellery he's supposed to have nicked, and there aren't any reliable witnesses to the shooting. They'll only have to let him go again. This is a waste of our time. Hold on, hold on, he's coming out. What's he doing? He's stopping for something. A bag he's got with him. Not sure. Could be a trick of the light. Think we'd better go and see? Yeah. Oh, hang on a minute. I think he's seen us. Oh, shit, he's going to get away. No, no, he's not. Oh, he's coming over here. We'll have to take him in. Good to see you, officers. What's the hurry? If you're going back to the station, perhaps you kindly give me a lift. It's on the way. I could have told you we'd have to let him go. There's no evidence against him, Chief. We'll wait it out, but we'll get him in the end. I don't care how, but we'll do it. Well, what about the evidence? We'll find the evidence, don't you worry. Anyway, I called you both in for something else, something much more important. Listen to this. Back in 1964, an American tourist called Rosanna McGraw was brutally murdered here in Sweden. It was a nasty story. Oh, God, really Rosanna, what the hell are they bringing this up for now? Be quiet, Colbert, listen. Oh, Almost ten years yeah. ago, Rosanna was found dead in the Yurta Canal, and a man called Volker Bengtsson was put in prison for her murder. You might ask why this should concern us here at Radio Malmö. Well, recent events have taken a very strange turn. Volker Bengtsson has been declared sane, and is living among ordinary people like you and me in a little village just outside Malmö. Fair enough, you might say. He served his sentence and needs to get on with his life. But the reason we're taking an interest in him right now is that his next door neighbor, Sigbrit Maud, has gone missing. And he was the last person to be seen with her. What we have to say is this. Is history repeating itself? Should a murderer be let out to live in the community? Is he being adequately monitored? What is our police force doing to protect us? Are the public still at risk? Ring Radio Malmö and tell us what you think. The lines will be open from 7 o'clock tonight and the number... 
What's this? Call for a lynch mob? You tell me. All I know is the police are right in the firing line. The powers that be are incandescent. They want to see some action immediately. What's it to do with us? Surely the local police have got things under control. You were the ones who nailed Bengtson, and I want you to do it again. Hold on. As I understand it, this woman's simply gone missing. There's no dead body, is there? And Bengtson hasn't said he's killed anybody, has he? Oh, what the hell's brought on this witch hunt? Once they realised the missing woman lived right next door to Banks and the local press started putting two and two together. Then we got the local radio and television and it'll only be a matter of time before we've got the national press baying for blood and demanding we put Bengtson back behind bars. Just because he killed Rosanna, it, it doesn't mean he's murdered this other woman. She might not be dead. She might have just gone away. Thank God they didn't say exactly where he lives. Where is it, anyway? A place called Anderslerve, near Malmö. A tiny place. What does he do there? He's got a boat, makes some kind of living smoking fish. Nothing illegal about that. I'm not prepared to argue with you, Beck. I want this affair settled, and I want you both on the plane to Malmö tonight. Tonight? Oh, shit. Sorry I'm late, it's the fog. Are you, um, you've been waiting long? Only a few minutes. Are you the reception committee? All right. Um, no, I, I'm all right. It's a silly day for a policeman. Um, hair got all right. Still, gives people a laugh. And um, you're Detective Superintendent Beck? Yes, and this is Detective Inspector Colbert. Hello. Well, thanks for coming to meet us. It's my pleasure. It's the first of me, Stockholm, sending detective from the National Murder Squad on one of our cases. We're, we're not used to this kind of attention in Anders Love. I'm sure everything will work out fine. Shall we get going? Yeah, yeah, of course. I think this affair is going to be a pain in the neck. We've got reporters from the national press sniffing around already. Well, it's only a missing person at the moment. There's nothing really unusual in that. She'll probably turn up. That's what often happens. I don't think so. Not that my opinion counts for anything, but calling in the murder squad, I'm sorry, but I really don't think it's necessary, do you? I couldn't agree with you more. I didn't mean you personally. Look, I... you might not want us, but we don't want to be here either. All right is sunburned and weather-beaten, with a battered safari hat pushed to the back of his head. He looks like a farmer, or at least like someone who works in calmer and healthier surroundings than his Stockholm colleagues. And as love is a far cry from the capital. The next morning, the sun is shining and a handwritten notice is taped to the Anders Lerv police station door. Office hours, weekdays 8.30 to noon and 1 p.m. to 2.30. Thursdays also 6 to 7 p.m. Closed Saturdays. Morning, gentlemen. Sleep well at the inn? Fine, thanks. Sorry to keep you waiting, but I had to take the dog out for a walk. Oh, boy, good. Good. Dan! Dan! Sorry about that, he's not trained, I'm afraid. Yeah, so I see. Well, I'm a policeman, so I suppose it makes him a police dog, in a way. Come on, boy. Good boy. Let's, let's, let's go upstairs to my place and have some breakfast, and I can fill you in on what's been happening. Uh, Britta will open the station at 8.30, and she'll let us know if anything special happens. That's fine. Coming, Colbert? Sure. He's a lovely boy, then. Good. Come on up. The station house is also the village hall, the social security office, and the library. Allwright's office has two large windows and two comfortable armchairs for visitors. The dog lies down underneath the desk. Look, here's the report. It's all very simple. Um, Sigrid Maud's gone missing. She's 38, divorced from a very unpleasant man, no children, works in a pastry shop in Trelleborg and lives alone. Tell us what happened. She had the day off, left her car to be fixed at the garage, went to the bank and the post office, where she was seen talking to Volker Bengtsson, and then she just disappeared. Anything in her car? Nothing. No clues. Nothing. Did you know her personally? Yeah. She's lived here for 20 years, always had a job. She seemed very normal. A bit frustrated, probably. What do you mean? Well, she's a, about the age when you begin to think, is this all there is? But for a bit of sex, a bit of excitement, you know? <laughs> Maybe do something daft, have stupid affairs, pick up younger men, stuff like that. She could simply have gone away. I don't think so. We went over her house. Everything's still there. Coffee pot and coffee cup still on the table. Looks as if she expected to be back any minute. What do you think's happened? I think she's dead. What about Volker Bengtsson? 
For the moment, he's not at home. I've not managed to track him down. Neither are any of the journalists. Perhaps he's just out on his boat. Possibly, but it's a bit unusual. Anyway, you know more about him than I do. Maybe, maybe not. We got him for a sex murder almost ten years ago. He was dislikable and disturbed. But what happened to him afterwards, we don't know. I know. Everyone in town knows. They declared him sane and let him out after seven and a half years. Moved here, bought a little house, a boat and an estate car and makes a living smoking fish and selling eggs. His stuff's good. Everyone likes it. What do people make of him? They've accepted him now. He's quiet, keeps himself to himself and seems to apologise for just existing. But... Yes? Everyone knows he's a murderer. Apparently a pretty ugly murder too. It was revolting. Sick. He felt he was sexually provoked, but it was a mixture of cruelty, puritanism and misogyny. How well do you think he knows Sigbrit Maud? He's her closest neighbour. Their houses are about 200 yards apart, but that's not the worst of it. Really? Several people saw him talking to her in the post office the day she went missing. His car was parked in the square and he left about five minutes after she did. There's another witness as well, not a very reliable one. Go on. An old lady, a well-known gossip and troublemaker... Well, she told me she saw Sigbrit walking down the street and Volker Bengtsson drove up in the other direction and, and he put his brakes on and stopped. She said she turned away for a moment and when she turned back, neither Sigbrit nor the car were anywhere to be seen. That's not much. No, but the next day, the woman stopped one of my men in the co-op and said she'd definitely seen Sigbrit get into the car. Well, if she sticks to that, then Volker Bengtsson is absolutely linked to the disappearance. Doesn't sound good. You know Bengtson? Yeah. Um, would he be capable of killing her? Yes, yes, he would. You said her ex-husband was very unpleasant. Did you mean violent? Drunk and violent. He used to be a sea captain. He lives in Malmö now. I, I know they kept in touch. She was the one who wanted the divorce. I, I think he still loves her, and I, I'll bet he's jealous. Then I guess we'd better interview him as well as Bengtson. Beautiful, isn't it? Scorner. Yes, it's really lovely. Beats city life hands down. Stockholm's a miserable city. If you say so. Uh, we should get on. I, I suppose you know we've been followed here. See that green Fiat with the two men in it? They've been with us ever since we left the station. Journalists? I imagine so. <laughs> Interesting to be shadowed. It's a new experience for me. You've seen the bus stop and Sigbrit and Volker Bengtsson's houses. I'm, I'm sorry he wasn't there. Let's hope he was fishing or delivering eggs to his customers. We'll check again later. I could drive you to Malmö and find Bartil Maud, Sigbrit's husband, if you like. Good idea. What about the journalists? Let's give them a sightseeing tour on the way, shall we? Hmm. Who are you? The head cop and his henchmen. Exactly. I've been in 108 countries and I've never seen such a load of shit. The cops are after you. Social security is after you, or the tax collector, or the welfare officer, or the power company, or the customs, or the national health. Even the bloody post office, and I don't want any post. How do you know it's 108 countries? Because I keep track, of course. Anyway, who the hell are you? My name's Martin Beck and I'm a policeman, head of something called the National Murder Squad. This is Detective Inspector Colbert. Hi. Who's the goon waiting outside? Inspector Allwright from Anders Love. Ah, him, is it? So what the hell do you all want? Mind if we sit down? <clears throat> Your ex-wife's been missing since October the 17th. And? We wonder where she is. I've already told the police, I don't know. On the 17th, I was on the train ferry having a few drinks. That's what I do most days. Sit on the Copenhagen boats and get drunk. Well, it looks like someone abducted her and your alibi's not up to much. I've got a bloody good alibi. I was on the ferry. What about that sex maniac next door to her? Shouldn't you be arresting him? I tell you, if he's done anything to Sigrid, I'll strangle her with my own bare hands. Why did you say her? You, you said strangle her. This isn't what I meant. Him. I'll strangle him. I love Sigbrit. 
Always have. How long were you married? Well, since she was 18. And I had to ship out two months after the wedding. But after that, I was nearly always at sea. But I'd come home for a month or two every year. And we'd have a good time. Um, sexually? <sighs> yeah. She said it was like being run over by a train. Was she faithful? She said so. I believed her. Were you? What do you think? I went to a brothel whenever I was in port. I told her I'd been faithful. And I made sure I didn't come home with the crabs and the clap and teeth marks. Thank God for penicillin. Why did you split up? Uh, my liver packed in. And I failed the physical for a captain and I got the sack. So I just sat around at home drinking and shouting. I beat her up a lot and she got sick of it and chucked me out. I could see why. I was damn sorry afterwards. I'd like to know something. What? Have you had sexual relations with her since the divorce? Sure. I've driven out and screwed her a few times, but it's been a while now. A year and a half at least. I'll tear that bastard to pieces if he's killed her. You should do some thinking about exactly what you were doing on the 17th, Captain Maud. Your alibi is almost worthless. Alibi? For what? Just get the hell out before I really get angry. Later on, Martin Beck, Colbert and Allwright drive out to Volker Bengtsson's house again. Allwright's dog sits in the back. They are now followed by a procession of ten cars, each one containing a journalist and some of them a photographer. So Sigbrit's husband's got a record, has he? It came through from Interpol this morning. In 1965, he was arrested in Trinidad for beating a man to death. Whatever happened? Police report called it justifiable homicide. What? He was found guilty of this justifiable homicide, fined four pounds and made to leave the country the following day. So, Maud's got a rotten alibi and a history of violence. What's his motive? Jealousy. Volker Bengtsson has no alibi at all and a history of violence. But does he have a motive? The motive would be that he's not all there. In any event, we're going to see him very soon. Hold on, I need a break. Keep an eye on the dog. So Allwright stops his car, climbs out, jumps over a ditch and disappears behind a little shed. He appears again a minute later, fastening his flies in full view of everyone in the line of cars. Just to make sure no one gets lost on the journey. We got all the papers and everything, Falker. You know me, I wouldn't come if it weren't necessary. Now yeah, we can sit down. Oh. Well, I suppose you know what this is all about. Yes. I, and you know these gentlemen? Yes, I know Detective Inspector Beck and Detective Colbert. They're much more senior now, if that makes a difference. We hear about Sigbrit Maud. You know her, don't you, Bankson? She lives next door. Well, she's missing. And no one's seen her since one o'clock on Wednesday the 17th. So I've heard. Witnesses say you spoke to each other in the post office the day she disappeared. And she wanted to buy some eggs and uh, said she could have a dozen. You know she didn't have her car that day? Yes. Did you offer her a lift? Absolutely not. It's utterly unthinkable. Why? I, I never give lifts, especially not to women. Why especially not to women? Women have caused me a great deal of unpleasantness in my life. We know. But that doesn't mean you can ignore the fact that half the people in the world are women. There are different kinds of women. Almost all the ones I've met have been bad. Bad? Bad human beings. Unworthy of their sex. We hear you left the post office just after Sigbrit, then you drove past her when she was waiting at the bus stop. I saw her and I might have slowed down, but I didn't stop. There's a witness who says she may have got in your car. I didn't stop. Have you ever seen Sigbert Maud's husband? Yes, twice. He's got a beige Volvo, hasn't he? And what do you think of Sigbert Maud? 
as a woman? Uh, sometimes I see her as a woman, but not often. What do you mean? I, I, I think she's disgusting, indecent, like an animal. She smells. He's nasty and he's nuts. It's as simple as that. Uh, he's behaving exactly the way he did when we questioned him about Rosanna. The hatred of women, the emphasis on the way they smell, how they behave like animals, it's all very familiar. But there isn't a body, so there isn't a murder and there's nothing we can accuse him of. There's something you might have missed. Yes? He said he'd seen her ex-husband visiting her in a beige Volvo, but I don't know when that could have been. Maud stopped coming out to see Sigbrit before Falker ever moved into that old house. I noticed that too. Maud told me he hadn't been to see her for a year and a half. Which might mean that Maud's lying. Or Bengtsson is. Hello? All right? What do you mean, all right? Uh, no, my, my name's all right. I need Beck. It's Commissioner Malm. Um, uh, just, just a minute. I'll see if I can find him. It's your commissioner. Do you want to talk to him? Yeah, I'll take it. Beck here. Well, how's it going? And for the time being, very badly. Listen, this is turning into a public scandal. The press are accusing us of letting a murderer slip through our fingers. We've become a laughing stock. You've got to arrest this Bengtsson and get him under lock and key. Well, he's certainly suspicious, but there's no real evidence against him. That doesn't matter. It's all over the press. They're busy rehashing the Rosanna case and baying for his blood. Oh, that's not very helpful. If you need reinforcements, men, helicopters, you know we can help. No, that's the last thing we need. Bengtsson's just sitting sitting quietly at home. So you'll be arresting him today? No. As much as I'd like to, there's not even a body. There's, there's, there's nothing to accuse him of. Are there any other suspects? We've just interviewed her ex-husband. Do you think it's him? Could be, but I, I don't think so. Then it's got to be Bankson. The evidence isn't good enough. We can't just bring him in because he hates women. You've got to put a stop to the newspaper stories somehow. Oh, I can see I'm going to have to help you get started. No, I'd rather you didn't. But a message from above comes less than half an hour after this conversation. Hi there, Falker. It's, it's only me. I was expecting you. I'm afraid you're going to have to come along to the station. It's time. I see. There's no rush. You can get changed and get a few things together. I... I can lend you a carrier bag if you need one. No, thanks. It's, um, it's just... I, uh, What's the matter, Falker? Well, uh, someone's got to feed the fish and uh, take care of the chickens. The aquarium's got to be cleaned out, too. I'll take care of it. Don't worry. Word of honour. Um, there's another thing you're not going to like. They'll be digging up your garden tomorrow. Why? I expect they'll be looking for a body. Um, what will I do about my egg customers? I'll take care of them. Don't worry. You're a good person, all right. We do our best. You know, we don't have much time, Falker. If, if you know anything about Sigbrit Maud, just tell me now. It, it'll make everything a hell of a lot simpler. I don't know anything. Except that I don't like her. The next morning, the police begin digging up Benson's garden. Martin Beck. Allwright and Colbert do another very thorough search of Sigbrit Maud's house and find a set of keys, a pocket calendar and two handwritten notes. The letter C is written on every Thursday of the calendar and the notes are signed, Love and Kisses Clark and I Love You, Clark. They also say, Sissy's brother's in town and I can't possibly get away. They look like love letters to me. Maybe she's run off with this fellow Clark. I love her with regular habits. I wonder why Thursday especially. Maybe that's the only time he can get away. Look, he says he must come on Thursday. That means they didn't meet at her place. Do you know anything about this Clark, all right? I don't think there's anyone called Clark around here. How can you be sure? I reckon to know just about everyone. But it's a very unusual name. What about Thursdays? What did Sigbrit do on Thursdays? Her boss in the Trellable pastry shop says she worked every day. Evenings too sometimes, but she always had Thursday evenings off. What if she has just disappeared with this clerk? 
Somewhere in the woods near Anders Love, a group of ramblers are walking along a path by a lake when one of their number slips and falls. Before he can get onto solid ground, his boot sinks deep into the mud. As the black ooze bubbles up, something begins to rise slowly out of the mire and the moss. An object takes shape before his eyes and it's a fraction of a second before his brain registers the fact that what he sees is a human hand. And then he screams. Sigbrit Maud is no longer missing. God awful place to be murdered, isn't it? Assuming this is where it happened. Well, no, after the post-mortem, if not before. I think someone could have driven here in an ordinary car. Yeah, I think so. Someone could probably have got as far as that stack of beach, but not much further. She looks pretty awful. They found her coat and blouse and handbag over there. They seem absolutely undamaged. They found anything in the bag? Usual stuff, handkerchief, mirror, comb, two sets of keys, birth control pills. One of the dogs has found some kind of cotton rag. We'd better send that off to the lab, see if there are any leads. And the keys, well, one set looked like the ones you got for her house, maybe the others for the pastry shop. What do you think? Sounds about right. My guess, she came here with someone she knew, took off her coat and blouse, and, and they killed her. Sound familiar? Sadly, yes. Disturbingly like Bengtson and Rosanna, isn't it? Uh-huh. The keys in Sigbert's handbag are neither for the shop where she worked, nor for her house. The Trelleborg police are given the unenviable job of trying to find out exactly what they are. It turns out that Bertelmord's car is a green Saab, and not the beige Volvo which has been seen outside Sigbrid's house. Maud's alibi has been backed up by the ferry crew and he is absolutely out of the picture. So this only leaves Volker Bengtsson, who is not saying anything. A few miles away, something is happening which will be of vital importance to the investigation. <laughs> Pastor Pete, come on, come on, we can do it! Come on, Krista, be the bastards! Master, master! Shit! They're catching up! You can do it! You can do it! Christ, Krista, which way are you going? Here we go! This is the police! Out of the car now, you little shits! When I say now, I don't mean tomorrow. Move! No tricks! We haven't done anything! That's what they all say. Borilun, look in the yes, back. Hail of Son, look in the boot. There's nothing in there. Shut up! Both of you, go over here. Now, keep your hands up. No. Watch this, pigs. Just watch me, Casper. Don't do it! Don't do it! Put that gun down, son. Now! Get a move on, Casper! Get in the car! Ah! Hell, what's happening? Get up. You okay? Bloody hell! I've told you already, there's one policeman killed and two more in a critical condition. One joyrider's dead and the other little bastard's driven away. What's this to do with us? It happened just outside Malmö. You're two of my top men and you're on the spot. We need to get this kid inside. I've decided you can mop up the Bengtsson murder and Colbert can lead the hunt for the boy. I don't like the sound of this. I don't care what you like. The press are all over us, so I'm taking personal charge and I don't think you need Colbert. Well, why don't you speak to him yourself? He's right here. No, no, that's not necessary. You just tell him to get over to Malmö straight away. You just nail Bengtsson. What does that interfering idiot want now? Three policemen and two joyriders were involved in a shootout between here and Malmo this morning. One of the boys got away, but the other one's dead. And so is one of the policemen. Bloody hell. Yeah. They're setting up a kind of manhunt, and you're to go to Malmo immediately. I'm to stay here to deal with the Sigbrit Maud murder. 
you'll be interested to know that the Chief's taking charge of the tactical command of the manhunt. What on earth is tactical command? I've no idea. Sounds self-important oh, to me. I hate all this military jargon. I used to like being a cop. But that was a hell of a long time ago. Three policemen shot at, one of them dead, and that arsehole in charge. Terrific. Well, I suppose I'd better pack and get ready for a manhunt. Wait, before you go, what's your view on Benson? I mean, your, your personal opinion. He's not all there, and he's a horrible piece of work. But there's really no evidence. I agree, but it, it's very like the Rosanna murder, isn't it? I hear we're losing you, Colbert. I'm sorry. So am I. I've liked being out of the city, and I've liked meeting you and a jog. But I'll be in touch. Well, good luck. Take care. Yeah. So long. All right, are you absolutely sure you don't know anyone named Clark with a wife called Sissy? There's no such person in the Anders Lerb district. I know absolutely everybody. You think that's possibly the man who killed Sigbrit? Maybe. Who knows? Mm. I'll be relieved if it isn't Bengtsson. People miss him when he smoked herring. And I'd rather it was someone who didn't live in Anders Lerb. Kaspar is now on the run and his companion is dead. He plans to go to Stockholm where he has friends who may hide him, but very soon the car begins to run out of petrol. He only has small change, so he has to pay with lots of five kroner pieces, which he and Krista had stolen from a piggy bank. The car he's driving is very anonymous. It's a beige Volvo. What the hell are you doing back in Stockholm, Colbert? Thought you were mopping up all the crime on the south coast. Ha, oh, bloody ha, Larson. You'll be pleased to know that the Chief's invented a tactical command, whatever that is, and he's moved his manhunt back here. What makes him think the boy's here? A couple of garages on the road north reported a young boy buying petrol with five kroner pieces. They said he seemed very frightened. The fool. Does anyone know who he is? Well, we think the killer was Krista Powelson. 24 with a record and just out of prison. The other one's probably Ronnie Casperson, known as Casper, both based in Stockholm. Casper! Hey, Casper! What's with the short hair? What made you get a scalp like that? I almost didn't recognise you. Maggie, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. We've missed you. Where have you been? What have you been up to? Nothing much. This and that. Do you want to get a coffee? Uh, I don't think so. I... I... Look, Maggie. I'm in a bit of trouble. I need to hide out somewhere. Trouble with the police? Yeah. Big trouble. Something that happened near Malmo. The shooting that's been in the papers? The policemen? Yeah. Hell, Caspar. That is big trouble. I know. Krista shot them. I was just there. I suppose I should tell you to go to the police. Please don't, Maggie. Don't worry, I won't. They're all bastards. I, I, I just don't know what to do. You could stay with me for a bit in the flat. My boyfriend won't like it, but he hates the cops, so he ought to understand. Have you got a car? Yeah, but I'm running out of petrol again. Don't worry, I've got money. We'll fill up on the way. Seeing that we've hit a bit of a brick wall with Volker Bates on, I think we should have a holiday and go out and shoot ourselves a pheasant and then eat it. I'm a hell of a cook. What do you think? Hmm, good idea. You can borrow some boots and a shotgun, lest you prefer to talk to Bates on again. No, thanks. We're not any further on. Oh, uh, the lab rang this morning. Oh, yeah? Uh, yeah. It, it, about that um, rag we found near the body. Um, to tell you the truth, I'd completely forgotten about it. What did they find? Uh, it contained cotton fibre, gravel, soil, clay, fat, oil and nickel shavings. Um, the gravel and soil came from the mud hole where we found Sigbrit, but the ground I picked it up from was a completely different type, so I can only assume that whoever murdered Sigbrit got his boots muddy and used this rag to dry them off. Nickel shavings are a bit out of the ordinary, aren't they? And where would they have come from? Some kind of specialised machine shop, I suppose. The lads in Malmö look into it. The chief's desperate for a conviction, but I really don't like it. Uh, look, let's forget about it for the moment. Time to go hunting. Yeah.
This really isn't a good place for you, Caspar. I'm not sure we can have you stopping here. Don't be so bloody unwelcoming, Breadman. He's got nowhere else to go. It's not lack of hospitality. There's trouble right outside the window. I can't see anything. There's a bloke by the bus stop. Yeah. And another in the doorway. Well? Both cops. Why are they there? They think I'm sitting on a whole load of jewellery, son. And they think I shot an old lady during the getaway. But you see, I couldn't have, because I was here in bed with Maggie at the time. And she swore to it, didn't you, sweetheart? Yes. They're watching me all the time, son, so it's not a great spot for you, is it? So, what's the news from Anders, love? Nothing further from Bengtsson. He still says how repulsive he found Sigbred, but won't admit to anything more. That doesn't surprise me. But we've sold the mystery of the keys in Sigbred's handbag. How? Some lads in the Trelleborg squad thought they'd show the big boys down from Stockholm how to do it, so they made lots of copies, put in hours of overtime, and kept at it till they found the right door. And where was it? A little flat in Trelleborg, which Sigbert had rented in her maiden name and paid every month in cash. Must have been a kind of love nest. Did you find anything? Some hairs on a pillow, one long blonde and a few short ones which were almost white. Nothing else? Some of the neighbours had seen a Volvo parked on the street. They thought it was beige, but they weren't sure. Mm. And Bengtsson? A brick wall. And the chief's still pushing very hard for a conviction. He's being totally unreasonable. Well, I shouldn't worry too much about the chief for a bit. Why? He's getting ready for a big operation to arrest the bread man. He's still trying to pin that robbery on the bread man. Get it in one. And when I say big operation, you won't believe just how big. You mean what, helicopters, dogs, automatic weapons, bulletproof vests? A lot. And yeah. he thinks that boy in the cop killings, Kaspar, might be with him. Really? Melanda happened to see him and a girl parking a car outside the bread man's flat. Melanda, being Melanda, recognised Kaspar from his photo in the files. So it's another of the Chief's tactical commands, is it? You said it. <laughs> Bloody hell. I'm glad I'm not there. Good <laughs> luck. The big police action goes wrong from the start. The Chief drives up in his command car to join the waiting men. He runs into one of the special dogs. When he gets out, it bites him. Jesus! Christ's sake, somebody get me something with his hand! Cordon off the area! Evacuate apartments! Neighbours to the cellar! Armed police storm the building. Frightened neighbours are herded into the cellar, and sharpshooters smash the windows. Action! The tear gas personnel lob a grenade into the building and it turns out to be a dud. Action! Apartment! Five heavily armed men storm the flat. But the only person in the apartment is Maggie. The breadman and Caspar are miles away by now. A police dog knocks Maggie over and bites her. Twice. Maggie is taken off in an ambulance. Larson and Colbert arrive on the scene too late to be either help or hindrance. When everything is over, they climb out of their car and walk over to the chief. Have you two only just got here? Yeah, no one at home, I see. We got the girl. Is she all right? A dog bit her. Uh, they've taken her to hospital. What's happened to Caspar and the breadman? They're on the run. And they've both got guns. Are you sure of that? Of course, I'm sure. But I need twice as many men next time. This time we didn't have enough, otherwise the plan went like clockwork. Come off. It was a farce. Did you really think the breadman wouldn't spot two policemen dressed as a telephone repairman and an ambulance man? I don't like your tone, Larson. Well, that's because I say what I think. But where the hell did you get this plan? It's not the Battle of Waterloo. Just remember who you're talking to. If you descend, me and Colbert here, by ourselves, we'd have Caspar and the breadman in custody by now. What's up, Colbert? You look miserable. It's Caspar. You're hunting him like an animal. And he probably hasn't done anything criminal except steal a car. Well, we don't know that, do we? I think we do. Guns, helicopters, grenades, and what have we got? A girl in hospital with a dog bite. It's pitiful. You watch it too, Colbert. We've got to see that nothing gets out. Absolutely nothing must get out. Bengtsson, Casper, what a mess. We can't prove they've done anything. What a rotten job. The next day, Colbert starts to write a letter of resignation. 
He can't settle and tears it up. He leaves the office and walks to the scene of the previous day's fiasco. Maggie's flat is so near the police station that he could almost have watched the chief's big operation from his office window. He wanders into the parking area behind Maggie's flat and there it is. The car that Casper stole from Malmö. It's a beige Volvo with obviously false number plates. All right here? Hi, this is Colbert. Everything OK? Not really, but I think I might have turned something up. Go ahead. We've got Caspar's getaway car. It's a beige Volvo. And Caspar says they stole it from just outside Malmö. Right. Has anyone reported one missing? If they have, can you look up the theft report and get me the vehicle identification number? Sure, I'll get onto it straight away. You think it might be the one outside Sigbrit Mall's house? It's a long shot, but it's a possibility. After two hours, Colbert picks up the phone again. This time he speaks to Martin Beck. OK, here it is. The engine numbers match. Great. Did all right give you the theft report? He certainly did. And do we have the name of the owner? You're not going to believe this. It's Clark Avert Sundström. Clark? Clark. Bingo. Did he report it missing? No, his wife did. I see. So Caspar and his pal stole it? Yes. According to this report, the wife, Cecilia... Cecilia. Sissy for short, like in the letters. Exactly. According to the report, she said he seemed reluctant to come to the police, and he kept saying they should wait and it'd turn up. In the end, she got so fed up that she reported it herself. What does this Clark Sundstrom do? His wife said he was some kind of manufacturer, that's all. Nickel traces on the rag by the body? How did you guess? Time for a visit. High time for a visit. You want to come along too? I don't think so, Martin. You probably won't like it, but there's something important I've got to see to. I just don't understand why you're doing this. I wouldn't expect you to. You've been in the force for 27 years. You're a bloody good policeman. Why the hell do you want to resign? Lots of reasons. The Chief's big operation. It's not just that stupid cock-up. It's being ordered around with no consideration. Stockholm to Anderslöv, Anderslöv to Malmö, Malmö to Stockholm, and all for nothing. Just so the Chief can play with his big toys and make a lot of bloody big bangs. <laughs> What's it achieved? We've got nowhere with Bengtsson, and Kasper's just a boy who stole a car. The Chief's determined to get convictions, even if they're not right. Everything we do is because he's frightened of the press. Yeah, you're a fool to go. You've achieved a lot over the years. I don't like what's happening. I don't think the police should behave like this, and I don't think we should be armed. But you're wrong. Maybe, but guns provoke more guns, and I'm just not suited to being a policeman anymore. I'm ashamed. The things we have to do, the way we're organised, the way we have to behave, I just don't want to do it any longer. After 27 years? The force has changed. Well, I can't believe how much it's changed. We're being used for political purposes and the greater glory of the people at the top. I don't like it, and I won't do it. Are you sure about this? I'm absolutely sure. I've written my letter. Now I'm going home. Even if Colbert doesn't believe they should be armed, when the police go to arrest the bread man and Caspar, they'll find themselves facing a whole arsenal of guns. Mag is still in hospital and her dog bites have gone septic. She develops a high fever and becomes delirious. She talks constantly about the cabin in the woods where the bread man and Caspar are hiding. By her bed sits Detective Sergeant Run who reports everything he's heard to Detective Inspector Larson. So she says they're holed up in a cabin out in Sodotor? Yeah. Did he get any details? Plenty. If you gave me a map, I could probably point to the actual cabin. This is a bit complicated. Shouldn't we tell the Chief? Yeah, definitely, but don't let's do it until we're about to leave. OK. Larson and Ruin have driven out to Sodatorn and parked Larson's car in a clearing in the woods near the cabin where the Breadman and Casper are hiding. They're looking at the cabin through binoculars. I reckon we've got about an hour before the chief moves in with his main force. God help us. He'll probably have a hundred men, two helicopters and ten dogs. Besides that, he'll have requisitioned twenty huge shields of armour plate. There'll be a massacre. You think the bread man and Caspar will put up a fight? 
Bradman's got nothing to lose. Caspar's probably been driven half out of his mind by now. I suppose so. I don't give a damn what happens to the Bradman. He's a professional criminal and he's just committed murder. It's Caspar I'm sorry for. So far he hasn't shot or injured anyone. But if the chief has his way, he'll either get himself killed or else kill a couple of cops. So we've got to get him first. So what's the plan? When we get out of the car and walk towards the cabin, call out that we're the police. Mm -hmm. If there's any shooting, we'll take cover behind that shit house. Mm -hmm. I'll try and get round the back of the cabin and take him from behind. You take cover and fire slowly towards the roof or to the left of the porch. I'm a bloody awful shot. Well, you must be able to hit a house, for Christ's sake. Well, yeah. At least I hope so. Andrew. Yeah? If anything goes wrong, don't take any chances. Stay undercover and wait for the Chief's great invasion. Yeah. This is Detective Inspector Larson. Come out with your hands up. Get behind this, it's house and aim for the roof. I'll go round the back. Here we go. Kick the bugger in. Shoot that bastard for God's sake, Casper! Shoot him! I can't! That's enough, Birdman. Drop that gun. Make me pig! Oh. Oh. Shit! Rude! Get in here! Put handcuffs on that one. I'm here. <laughs> Oi, get your hands behind your back now. You don't need handcuffs, do you? <laughs> no. Oh. <laughs> Hold on, last one. Your jacket's torn. Bloody <laughs> hell. What a pain in the arse. <laughs> Casper told them exactly where they'd stolen the Volvo, and thanks to Colbert, we've now found Clark. Good on, Colbert. Where do we go from here? I think we pay a visit to Mr Clark Sundström, don't we? His factory needs nickel for their manufacturing, and the experts say the letters are in his handwriting. I'd say we had enough evidence to arrest him straight away. You want to come with me? Oh, you bet. But you talk to him alone. I'll wait in the car. I'm Detective Inspector Beck. I wonder if I could speak to Mr. Clark Sundström. He's not feeling at all well. He's gone to lie down. Well, I'm sorry to have to bother you. It's Mrs. Sundström, is it? Yes. I'm afraid it's absolutely necessary, so if he isn't is too ill... Is it about I... the factory? No, not directly. It's a matter of a few questions I have to discuss with him, so if you Can't could... Can't it wait till tomorrow? He's feeling very poorly. I'm afraid it can't. It's very important. It's all right, Sissy. I'll speak to the inspector. You go into the girls. Very well. Now, you tell me what this is all about. You know what this is all about. Yes? Sigrid Maud. <laughs> Can we go out and talk? I need some fresh air. Bye. Mr. Sundström, we have proof that you killed Sigrid Maud. We've seen the flat in Trelleborg, and I have a warrant for your arrest in my pocket. What proof? How can you have proof? Among other things, we found a rag at the murder spot that we can trace to you. We have your letters. We know about the flat. So tell me, why did you kill her? I had to. <coughs> You're feeling all right? No. Come to the police station with me. We can talk better there. Sigrid. Sigrid. Get my wife! He's had a coronary. He's awake now, but I'm keen as short as you can. Mr. Sernström. Mr. Sernström, how do you feel? All right. I, I don't know. Do you remember me? I remember you coming, and then we went outside. Nothing else. Do you remember what we were talking about? Sigrid Moore. 
I don't feel well. I don't want to talk about her. Just tell me how you got to know her. We... We met at the pastry shop where she worked about three years ago. We used to go in there for a cup of coffee. And then? I saw her in town one day, asked if she wanted a lift. So I drove her home and we went to bed together. That's all you want to know, isn't it? Was she in love with you? I suppose so. What makes you say that? Last spring, she started talking about moving in together and getting married and having kids. And did you want to? Did you want a divorce? Christ, no. It would have been a financial catastrophe. The house we live in belongs to my wife, and the factory belongs to her, too. Mm, so what happened? Did Sigrid become troublesome? She started threatening me. Said she was going to talk to my wife. I couldn't see any way out. If Sissy knew I had a mistress, she'd kick me out without a second thought. Then where'd I be? So? I just wanted to be rid of her. I couldn't bear her anymore. I just, I didn't know what to do. Then I remembered the man who lived next door to her. I reckoned I could kill her, make it look like a sex murder, and everyone would think it was him. Weren't you afraid an innocent man would be convicted for something you'd done? He'd already killed one person, and he shouldn't have been let out anyway. How did you do it? Strangled her. I drove her to the woods, and she thought we were going to make love. We used to do that sometimes, outdoors in the summer. <laughs> Clark Sundstrom suddenly stares at Martin Beck, and his eyes go rigid. He chokes. His lips tighten across his teeth, and there is a rattling in his throat. Clark raises his left hand. Martin Beck takes his wrist and stands up. Clark grasps him convulsively. Nurse! Nurse! Somebody! Martin Beck glances up and sees the bright green dot of the heart monitor moving across the screen in a straight line. I had a warrant in my pocket and we were taping everything he said. Well, it's all wrapped up now. Yeah. Tired? Yes. Tea? Yes, please. You going home now? My plane leaves in two hours. We can take off in this fog. We'll call the airport and find out. Thanks. Oh, I was never sure about Falker Benson, but the murder was so like Rosanna's. Still. No, I'm glad it wasn't him. He's back home now. I drove past where he lives an hour ago and he was hard at work fixing the hen house. Good. He said he'd be back delivering eggs in the morning and smoked herring in a few days. We'll soon be back to normal. What'll happen to Sigbrit's house? She didn't have any relatives, did she? I suppose there'll be an auction. You're not thinking of moving down here, are you? Mm. <laughs> you could always try and persuade Colbert to come with you. <laughs> I'm going to miss him. Unofficially, of course. We could all go pheasant shooting. No, I'd like that. Coming back. You know, t together, I mean. Good. I look forward to it. And all right. Yeah? Thanks. Thanks for everything. Two hours later, Martin Beck's plane banks steeply, and the fields of Scorner lie beneath him in the sunshine, while off to the south he can see the Baltic, blue and sparkling. Then his view disappears as the plane climbs into a bank of clouds and heads north. Martin Beck is on his way home. In Cop Killer by Mai Huerval and Per Valeur, Martin Beck was played by Stephen McIntosh and Lennart Colbert by Neil Pearson. Hergot Allwright was played by Howard Coggins 
Gunfeld Larson by Ralph Ineson, and Aina Run by Wayne Foskett. Nicholas Murchie was Malm, Ben Crow was Carl Sundström, and Kenneth Collard was Bartil Nord. John Mackay played Volker Bengtsson, Paul Mundell played the Breadman, Fraser Burrows played Casper, and Will Howard played Krista. Maggie was played by Jenny Harold, Mrs. Sundström by Philippa Stanton, Sigbrit Maud by Joanna Brooks, and the radio reporter by Will Glennon. The narrators were Leslie Sharp and Nicholas Gleaves. Cop Killer was dramatised for radio by Jennifer Howarth. Original music was by Elizabeth Purnell, and the director was Sarah Davis.